Who are the witnesses? Committee will come to order. Let me begin by thanking all of you for being here. When the committee held its first hearing on the Bank of America Merrill Lynch merger over five months ago, I asked a few simple but vital questions. First, how did a private sector deal announced in September 2008 wind up as a major government bailout with the taxpayers on the hook for $20 billion. Second, I ask whether the government forced Bank of America to go through with this deal. Finally, I ask whether Bank of America CEO Ken Lewis really had a legitimate basis for backing out of the Merrill Lynch deal, or when he realized late in the game that there were serious problems with the deal, did he threaten to back out to gain leverage for a taxpayer bailout? Today, as a result of our investigation, I think the answer to those questions are much clear. Each senior bank of America executive who was involved in the deal has told the committee that the government did not force them to go through with it. Ken Lewis has also told us that nobody in the government did anything improper during this transaction. If there are still people who want to say the government forced Bank of America to go through with the deal, they are turning a blind eye to the facts we have before us. A simple but important fact is that the government did not elbow its way into this transaction. Ken Lewis called then Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson on December the 17th, 2008, <clears throat> and brought the government to the table. That one phone call started everything in motion. On that phone call, Ken Lewis claimed that he believed Bank of America could back out of the deal with Merrill Lynch based on the material adverse change clause in the merger agreement, the so-called MAC clause. What we know now is that Bank of America top lawyer Tim Myopoulos told two top Bank of America executives on December the 1st, 2008, that Bank of America did not have a MAC. Mr. Myopoulos was suddenly fired nine days later without explanation and replaced by a senior insider who had not practiced law in years. Our investigation has also uncovered documents showing that on December the 15th, 2008, lawyers working for Bank of America knew that to win a MAC, it is not enough to show a short-term earning decline, no matter how severe, must show decline in value over a period of years, not months. Nonetheless, Ken Lewis called Hank Parson on December 17th and said Bank of America actually had a MAC. Again on December 19th, lawyers working for Bank of America gave his executives a memo that noted that Delaware courts had never found that a MAC occurred allowing the buyer to terminate a merger agreement. <clears throat> Excuse me. Nonetheless, two days after receiving that memo, Mr. Lewis again called Secretary Paulson and threatened to back out of the deal. Finally, the committee has obtained notes showing that Bank of America outside counsel 
believed on December the 18th that they had at least an 80% chance of losing a MAC claim. Perhaps the most telling of all documents is the one where a lawyer of Bank of America writes, and quote, threat of MAC, don't push too far. Turn, it could turn against us. The documents and testimony the committee has reviewed clarify that the Bank of America was aware that the chances of prevailing on the MAC were very slim. Merely invoking the MAC could have led to significant adverse financial consequences for the company. <clears throat> Based on the fact we have before us, it sure looks like it was a Bank of America that was holding the shotgun at this wedding. Today we will hear from Tim Myopoulos, the lawyer who was fired nine days after telling Bank of America executives there was no MAC. We'll also hear from Brian Moynihan, the person who replaced Mr. Myopoulos, <coughs> excuse me, and who determined sometime between December the 15th and 17th that Bank of America could back out of the deal by invoking the MAC. After replacing Mr. Myopoulos, Mr. Moynihan served as the general counsel for about 44 days. He stopped serving as the general counsel about six days after the bailout was a done deal. He is now president of Consumer and Small Business Lending at Bank of America. <clears throat> we will also hear from two Bank of America directors who were on the board when this deal and the bailout went through and who now are helping choose the next Bank of America CEO. At this point, our investigation has shed a great deal of light on a deal that was secretly made and the, at the cost of the taxpayers' billions. Although the investigation may be coming to a close, I am certain that no member of this committee will stop working until all the taxpayers' dollars that Bank of America received are paid back. Thank you very much. And on that note, I yield to the ranking member of the committee, um, Mr. Darrell Ice of California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have greatly appreciated your willingness to engage <coughs> in necessary oversight of the Bush administration, I repeat, the Bush administration's decision to force Bank of America and other banks to accept TARP funds and subsequently force Bank of America to acquire Merrill Lynch. Unfortunately, the bipartisan nature of the investigation appears to have stalled at today's hearing. First, Mr. Chairman, there has never been a shotgun wedding in which the groom held a shotgun to himself. As you have said in the past, this was a shotgun wedding, and the only people that could have held the shotgun was the Bush administration, Paulson and Geithner, and we all know that. I regret the investigation today has now become apparent cover-up of the continuing activities of the Obama administration, and particularly Secretary Geithner. In securing promises of billions of dollars of taxpayer support in exchange for Bank of America's waiver of its contractual right, even if it was only 20 percent likely, to attempt to negotiate a lower price using that 20 percent likely MAC clause for Merrill Lynch. At one time, Mr. Chairman, you were willing to follow the trail of misconduct wherever it led. Now that the trail may lead to a cabinet officer in the Obama administration, this committee's time and resources have been redirected toward the political scapegoating of Bank of America. As a businessman, I said some time ago that I saw through what Ken Lewis was doing. What he had was he had losses which, if put back into the correct places they should have been, in other words, recalculating the profits not made as a result of those losses, he had a good case for a MAC. He had a good case for saying in an Enron-like fashion that, in fact, Merrill Lynch had overstated their profits by booking these as good when, in fact, a after the fact, they were known to be wrong. That's no different than Enron. You can't call a profit a profit when it's clear that it ultimately was a risky investment likely to lead to failure and, in fact, it had led to, bi led to billions of dollars in failure. Ken Lewis was doing what most tough negotiators do, found an opportunity to get a dramatically better price, one that would have saved 
his company money and ultimately the stockholders uh, money. And yet the Bush administration under Secretary Geithner, then Fed Chairman of New York, and Secretary Paulson forced the issue and used money, both literal and, and figuratively, as justification for why they must go through. Literally because they offered the money and Secretary Geithner offered it repeatedly verbally during the transition team. Figuratively because they offered to take Ken Lewis and his company down if they later needed money and did not go through with the merger. Bank of America CEO Ken Lewis repeatedly asked the Bush administration to put purely verbal comments for additional taxpayers' money into writing. But both Hank Paulson and Ben Bernanke re refused. Instead, they sought to control disclosure for this new bailout until the la <clears throat> last possible date. The incoming Obama administration's support for the commitment of billions of additional taxpayer dollars was absolutely essential to ensure Bank of America's cooperation in this purely verbal backdoor deal. Mr. Chairman, we do not want to see lawyers doing verbal things, and yet in this case we had no memos that we could rely on and no written contracts. Mr. Chairman, where is Tim Geithner, who could in fact verbally and under oath give us the answers to our questions? The fact is, where is Sheila Bear? Where in fact is Mary Shapiro, or even where is Chris Cox? Where is the government? Change has come, Mr. Chairman. Under the Bush administration, whether Republicans or Democrats were in charge of this committee, we brought in administration officials. The witnesses that we're going to hear from today are appropriate, and they will speak to their view of what happened. But we've already had Ken Lewis here under oath testifying to his explanation of what happened and it has not been refuted by any of the uh, subsequent documentation, discovery, or testimony. Mr. Chairman, as a ranking member, I do not have subpoena authority. As ranking member, I do not have the ability to get a witness. As ranking member, I will be asking for, in writing, another minority hearing. I will because, in fact, we had majority and minority agreement on this panel and the panel which is not here today Mr. Chairman, my request for a minority hearing will be for the exact people that you have chosen to drop off of this list after agreeing. I ask for nothing more. Mr. Chairman, it is very clear that we cannot feel the change has come and therefore the Obama administration no longer can make a mistake, even when in fact the people who made the mistake under the Bush administration are now in the Obama administration. With that, I yield back. Here we go again. Let me say that uh, if the ranking member would like for me to pull out a calendar, I am happy to do so and remind him that this merger and bailout occurred uh, during the previous administration. And if he had such strong feelings and concerns about it, uh, this bailout, I wonder why he was not asking the Bush administration the tough questions last year. I now yield to the gentleman from Ohio. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. This investigation started with questions. How could a merger of the largest bank and second largest investment bank in the country require a government bailout only weeks after shareholders had voted to approve it as a private deal? Was it true that the financial situation shifted so dramatically in that short amount of time? Or did top management know, or should they have known, about the changing situation much earlier? Did they fail to make necessary disclosures to their shareholders? When we asked Ken Lewis, Bank of America's CEO, about this at our first hearing, he told us that he relied on the advice of counsel and that he relied on forecasts from Merrill Lynch. Recently, in response to our request, Bank of America produced to us the documents on which they based their decision not to make additional shareholder disclosures, as well as the notes from some of the discussions that led to that decision. This included the actual forecast that was created by Merrill Lynch and used by Bank of America's lawyers as a basis to determine if there was something shareholders should know before they approve the merger. Our examination of this forecast and how it was used should sound alarms about how Wall Street really operates. The forecast, when it was created by Merrill Lynch on November 12th, 
revealed that in October the company had absorbed in just one month more losses than in the entire previous quarter and half the amount of losses in the fourth quarter of the previous year. Yet, incredibly, the forecast omitted to make any projections of how the most troublesome investments, collateralized debt obligations, subprime mortgage-backed securities, credit default swaps, would perform in the next two months, November, December. The forecast assumed those investments would have zero effect on Merrill Lynch's bottom line for two-thirds of the remaining fourth quarter. Bank of America saw the deficiency in the document, but they have not shown us that they actually did any actual analysis to make up for Merrill omissions. On the contrary, the evidence we have suggests that Bank of America pulled a number out of thin air. Far from being consistent with the actual experience of October or what they knew about the third quarter, the guess wishfully assumed that the markets for uh, collateralized debt obligations and credit default swaps would be significantly better in November, December. It was assumed that Merrill Lynch would almost break even for November, thereby spreading October's bad results over two months. Then the attorneys at Bank of America and Wachtel Lipton went to work. They did not question the financial information they were given. They began with the assumption that additional shareholder disclosure was necessary, and they discussed what kind of disclosure they would make. But after studying the question for a week, they decided that the news was not sufficiently out of line from past performance and previous disclosures to warrant further shareholder disclosure. Thus, on the advice of counsel, Bank of America did not make any further disclosures to its shareholders in advance of the merger vote. Within only weeks, however, reality crowded out the wishful thinking. Far from having a small effect, those collateralized debt obligations and other exotic instruments continued to lose large amounts of money. Bank of America's guess, which had played a significant role in the decision not to make additional disclosures to shareholders, proved to be billions off the mark. That's when, when Bank of America went to the U.S. government for help. This investigation has opened up a rare window onto the management suite of the largest bank in the country. Here's a story of how Bank of America's top executives allowed guesswork, guesswork to masquerade as act actual expert knowledge, and how numbers pulled out of the air without any actual analysis served as the basis for corporate decisions made about other people's money, shareholders' money. Unfortunately for all of us, I doubt Bank of America is unique. Look around to see what the geniuses of Wall Street have wrought. The house of cards they have built that have buried our constituents under debts they can't pay, record rates of foreclosure and joblessness. If you think these bankers and financiers deserve the millions of dollars they're paid and the bonuses they award themselves, if anyone thinks they can be trusted with running companies that are too big to fail, Think again. The Wizards of Wall Street are no more wizard than the Wizard of Oz, except unlike the Kingdom of Oz, when that kingdom falls, there's wreckage all over America. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now yield to the gentleman from Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Jordan. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just want to respond to some, your, your previous statement. Uh, this, is, this is not about one administration holding one administration accountable, not the other. This is about holding government accountable. I mean, that, that's, the, that's this committee. This is the Government Oversight Committee. And the, the ranking member's suggestion that we need Ms. Shapiro, Mr. Mr. Cox, Ms. Bear, Mr. Geithner here is exactly on target. No one in our previous hearings, which I appreciate, no one went after the previous administration, uh, specifically Secretary Paulson, harder than ranking member I said myself. We just want the opportunity to go after the same folks question the same folks who, who were now in, in, the, in, in our current administration who were involved in this decision. Uh, the chairman mentioned shotgun being held to people. I mean, the, the only shotgun involved here was what, what the government held to Bank of America's head when they forced them to take tar I mean, think about the nine days after this passed, they forced Bank of America, when, when Bank of America had to sit down with eight other big institutions in this country, forced them to take TARP money. The, the only, and then in the deal itself, 
That's why we need officials who were involved in this, in this whole decision here. Um, as I suggested in, our, in some of our previous hearings, uh, I think Mr. Paulson actually misled the Congress. When he, when he came in front of the Congress last year, demanding, the, asking for the TARP money, and then, as I said, nine days later, changing course dramatically and saying, we're not, we're not going to purchase any of these mortgage-backed securities. We're just going to give capital to the banks. So the question that Mr. Issa asked, I think, is, a, is, is right on target. The unprecedented moves we've seen from the government, the unprecedented pressure we've seen from the government on this, this institution, uh, I think, requires us to get Mr. Geithner, Mr. Cox, Ms. Baer, Ms. Shapiro in front of this committee. And I hope that the chairman will do that so we can have a full airing of what took place and ask the appropriate questions. And with that, I would yield some time to the ranking member if he'd like. If not, I'd yield time. I thank the gentleman. I, I just want to set the record straight a little bit because I think it is, it's important. First of all, we understand that we're not the Financial Services Committee. The SEC does not report to us. And in fact, the SEC has more jurisdiction over this por commercial portion than we do. But we are the Government Oversight Committee. And I certainly, I would join with uh, my colleague from Ohio, in this case, Marcy Kaptur. We led the charge and worked to try to defeat the TARP because we knew that the money would not be properly spent the way the administration brought it to us. And as it turns out, just days after they got the money, they spent it in a very different way. So I think that when, we, when we're setting the record straight, we're setting the record straight that we didn't think the last administration should have these hundreds of billions of dollars of walking around money loosely disguised as an emergency fund for a specific reason, and that, in fact, a merger which was approved on December 5th, uh, consummated around December 17th, I'm sorry, consummated on December 31st, in those 20 days that Bush, President Bush was still in office, there wasn't any oversight we could have done. We weren't even in session except to, to, to organize. What we did do is those of us who fought on a bipartisan basis uh, the funding of TARP continued to say that these were outlandish ways to spend the money, that this was wrong for us to be part and parcel of mergers and acquisition and price setting. And uh, so today, I think this committee needs to stand up to what we were doing in the last Congress and continue to look at where government failed us. And it doesn't matter whether it was Republican or Democratic governor, government. We need to continue to do that. And we certainly need to see that the remainder of the TARP not continue to be spent in a way that you yourself, Chairman, have called a shotgun wedding. And I thank the gentleman for yielding. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Let me just say that before we, before we move forward, um, you know, I think that to make that assessment before we hear from our witnesses, uh, I mean, you don't know what they're going to say, how much they're going to say. And based on the fact that what has been said up to this point, you know, by Mr. Lewis, who indicated that the government in no way acted in, improper. I mean, this is what he said. Now, I, the question is, if you don't believe in terms of his comments or his statement, then that's another issue. But in the meantime, we're going to move forward. Will the witnesses please stand? You may be seated. Going from my left to right, our witnesses today are Timothy Myopoulos, was General Counsel of Bank of America for nearly five years from January 2004 until December the 10th, 2008. He is currently the Executive Vice President of General Counsel and Secretary of Fannie Mae. Mr. Moynihan was the General Counsel of Bank of America from December the 10th, 2008 to January the 22nd, 2009. He currently serves as the President of Consumer and Small Business Lending at Bank of America. Mr. Guilford, and Mr. May are currently on the Bank of America Board of Directors and were on the board last December when the bank received its bailout. They are both also on the committee that is selecting the replacement for Mr. Lewis. Mr. Myopoulos, please give your opening statement and you have five minutes and of course, and the light starts out on green, then it turns to uh, yellow and then of course it turns to red and when it gets to red, we ask if you would stop, which will allow the members an opportunity to be able to raise questions after all the witnesses are finished. Thank you. Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Issa, members of the committee, thank you for the committee's invitation to appear before you today. My name is Tim Iopoulos. Bank of America recently waived its attorney-client privilege with respect to the Merrill Lynch merger, 
and has you instructed. You want to pull the mic a little closer to you. And has instructed me that I am free to answer questions the committee may have for me. Accordingly, as the committee has requested, I will briefly summarize and have set forth in more detail in my written testimony the legal advice Bank of America received in connection with the Merrill Lynch merger, as well as the circumstances of my departure from the company on December 10, 2008. I served as general counsel of Bank of America for five years. I was responsible for overseeing a very large number and wide range of legal matters. In the case of the Merrill Lynch merger, I relied heavily on the company's outside counsel, who were leading lawyers at the esteemed law firm of Wachtell, Lipton, Rosen, and Katz, as well as my own in-house legal department. Questions have been raised about what legal advice Bank of America received as to whether to disclose to shareholders the amount of the potential 2008 bonus pool for Merrill Lynch employees. To my recollection, I had no role on this issue. I do not recall anyone raising or discussing with me whether the potential year-end bonus pool for Merrill employees should be disclosed to shareholders. As far as disclosure was concerned, as was my practice, I relied on Wachtell Lipton and our in-house legal staff to prepare the proxy statement properly and accurately. The committee has asked what legal advice Bank of America received regarding the material adverse change provisions of the merger agreement. The only advice I recall giving about these provisions was on December 1, 2008. I advised Joe Price, Bank of America's Chief Financial Officer, and Greg Curl, then Bank of America's Head of Corporate Strategy, that for Merrill's poor financial performance to constitute a material adverse change, it had to be disproportionate to that of other companies in the industry, including Bank of America. We discussed the relative performance of the two companies since the merger had been announced, and I advised Mr. Price and Mr. Curl that there was no basis to conclude that a material adverse change had occurred with respect to Merrill Lynch. The committee has also asked what advice Bank of America received with regard to whether it should disclose Merrill Lynch's projected losses for the fourth quarter of 2008. The Wachtell Lipton lawyers and I gave advice on that topic to Mr. Price. Everyone involved concluded that disclosure of the projected losses was not warranted. There were a number of reasons. First, because the materials announcing the merger in the proxy statement did not contain any projections or estimates of Merrill Lynch's future performance, there was no legal duty to update past disclosures about future performance. Second, Merrill Lynch's recent financial performance put investors on notice that Merrill might well suffer multi-billion dollar losses in the fourth quarter. Over the 12-month period beginning with the fourth quarter of 2007, Merrill Lynch had experienced after-tax losses of approximately $22 billion for an average quarterly after-tax loss of more than $5 billion. Third, the proxy statement and other disclosure documents clearly informed investors that unprecedented adverse market and business conditions could continue to impact Merrill Lynch negatively. Finally, there were also many highly publicized events that were warning signs to investors that financial institutions would remain under great stress and might continue to incur significant losses, including, among others, the near failure of Bear Stearns, the collapse of Lehman Brothers, the government's rescue of AIG, and the government's extraordinary actions to authorize the expenditure of $700 billion to try to save the financial system. Moreover, the estimates were based in part on guesses as to what the loss would ultimately be. It is obvious in hindsight that if either the $5 billion or the $7 billion loss estimates of which I was informed had been publicly disclosed to shareholders at that time, shareholders would have been misled as these estimates turned out to be wildly incorrect. No one ever suggested to me that the losses were expected to reach $15 billion as they ultimately did. With regard to my departure from Bank of America, Amy Brinkley, the company's chief risk officer, advised me a little before noon on December 10, 2008, that Ken Lewis had decided to replace me as general counsel. Ms. Brinkley said I was being terminated effective immediately and that I was to leave the premises immediately. I was stunned. I had never been fired from any job, and I had never heard of the general counsel of a major company being summarily dismissed for no apparent reason and with no explanation. I cannot tell you why I was fired. I don't know. After I left Bank of America on December 10, I was never consulted about any of the matters I had been working on. Accordingly, I cannot tell you what legal advice the company received after I was gone. I can assure the committee that at all times, I acted in good faith to provide legal advice that I believe to be appropriate, considered, and in the best interests of Bank of America and its shareholders. I did my best to be a good, careful, and honest lawyer. I would be pleased to answer any questions that members may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Markopoulos. Uh, Mr. Moynihan. 
Good morning and thank you, Mr. Chairman, Congressman Issa, Subcommittee Chairman Kucinich, Ranking Member Jordan and the rest of the committee. My name is Brian Moynihan and I serve as the President of Global Consumer Small Business and Card at Bank of America. Uh, prior to that uh, job, I served in many capacities, including uh, running the group that Merrill Lynch came into in January 2009. I also served as Bank of America's General Counsel, and prior to that, I served as Deputy General Counsel for a predecessor company. And prior to that, I was a law partner in private practice, and I specialized in merger and acquisition, financial institutions, securities law, and other matters relating, in particular, to the financial sector. I want to touch on two points today. First, well, not, well, not the specific point, but the backdrop of this committee hearing, I want to briefly discuss how our company, Bank of America continues to help homeowners, families, and businesses weather the economic challenges we all face. And second, I want to talk about how our acquisition of Merrill Lynch helped prevent a further financial collapse last winter. The, turn, the deal turned out to be a good deal for our shareholders and our customers. But most importantly, it turned out to be a good deal for the taxpayers who presided assistance. We acted in good faith in the best interest of our shareholders and the country in mind. Let me turn to my first point. I know you hear from constituents as we hear from our customers about the challenges they face in today's economy. Bank of America is doing all we can to help them. We understand the public expects that of us, especially as a financial institution that received taxpayer assistance. As we recently announced in our quarterly, quarterly lending and investment report, we have extended $759 billion in loans since our first report late last year. That represents $17 for every dollar of financial assistance we've received. Making home loans is a priority for our company. In the first nine months of 2009, we've made almost $300 billion in home loans available to over a million customers. We've also made $255 billion of credit available to large and small businesses. In addition to that, we've made $26 billion in credit available to municipalities and other nonprofits. All these figures don't include the $1.5 trillion that we've committed to invest in low and moderate income communities around our, our country, and also don't include the $200 million in support we provide to charitable organizations on a yearly basis. I now turn to my second point, the, point, the topic of today's hearing. I think it's important to keep one thought in mind throughout our discussion today. Although the Merrill Lynch transaction and Merrill Lynch itself as a company was severely impacted by the worst dislocation that the financial markets have seen since the Great Depression. Our acquisition of Merrill Lynch is a success. First, the acquisition has provided great benefits to our customers. A stable Bank of America, Bank of America Merrill Lynch platform can simply provide more capital to more businesses in these tough times. Second, the taxpayers are also benefiting from a stronger financial system and more directly in the form of the financial return they're receiving on their investments. Third, closing the transaction in December 2008 was in the best interest of the financial system, the economy, and the country. As the committee has heard in prior testimony, the failure of Merrill Lynch in December 2008, particularly on the failure of the Lehman Brothers and other financial firms, would have exacerbated the economic havoc that our country faced. And I'm proud that Bank of America stepped forward. Bank of America has cooperated and will continue to cooperate with this committee to help develop a better understanding of the circumstances surrounding this transaction. The record created by the testimony and those documents shows, and I hope my testimony today will help further demonstrate, that throughout the deliberations with Merrill Lynch around the acquisition, Bank of America acted in good faith and consulted with one of the premier law firms in the country to address very difficult issues. Business people, confronted with complex business and legal issues, acted in an open and honest manner. All the parties involved, including the lawyers, did their level best to address and balance the merits of these complex questions in a time of great stress and in the face of unprecedented economic conditions. Thank you for the opportunity to make this statement, and I'm pleased to answer your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moynihan. Uh, Mr. Gifford. Uh, Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Isis, Subcommittee Chairman Kucinich, Ranking Member Jordan, my name is Chad Gifford. I have been a member of the Bank of Board of Directors since 2004 when Bank of America acquired Fleet Boston, where I had served as Chairman and Chief Executive Officer. I was Chairman of the Bank of America Board from April 2004 to January 2005, and I have continued to serve as a member of the Board since then. Mr. Chairman, I understand the Committee's interest in gaining my perspective on Bank of America's acquisition of Merrill Lynch. Sorry, sir. 
Oh, sorry. Uh, I, I assume I don't need to go again, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. I would only like to make two observations at this point. First, I believe the Bank of America Merrill Lynch combination is already bearing fruit. Merrill Lynch has been accretive to Bank of America earnings for the year to date, and the systemic benefits envisioned when the Board approved the merger are already beginning to take hold. Although it is fair to say I had a number of probing questions about the transaction at the start, I firmly believe that over the long haul, Merrill Lynch will continue to be an important contributor to Bank of America's profitability. Second, as someone who has spent his entire professional career in the banking sector, I can attest that the financial crisis of 2008 was simply unprecedented in its depth, breadth, and velocity. Even in the midst of it, prediction of, predictions of how bad it would get consistently understated the scope, the severity, and its duration. Our government, elected and appointed officials, took bold action and made extraordinary decisions to stabilize the financial system. For these measures, those of us in the banking industry should be grateful. I want to take this opportunity to personally say thank you to the American people. As the process of the recovery moves forward, admittedly slowly, we at Bank of America will always remind, remain mindful of what was done to stabilize our system and of our important role in helping these decisions work for our customers, families, businesses, and investors. Thank you again for the opportunity to participate in today's hearings, and I too look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Guilford. Um, I, we were caught off guard with your shortness. I mean, but that, that's unusual around here. We generally have to stop people. So thank you. Uh, Mr. May. Chairman Towns, uh, Ranking Member Issa, Subcommittee uh, Chairman. Is your mic on? Kucinich. Uh, yes, it is. And Ranking Member Jordan, my name is Tom May. Uh, I am uh, Chairman, President, and CEO of NSTAR, a Massachusetts-based public utility holding company. And I have been a member of the Bank of America Board of Directors since 2004. Uh, I, I also appreciate the opportunity uh, to be here today to discuss uh, Bank of America's acquisition of Merrill Lynch. Uh, I'd like to associate myself uh, with the remarks of Mr. Gifford and Mr. Moynihan so that I can be brief also. Uh, the Bank of America Merrill Lynch merger is working, thanks in no small part uh, to our extraordinary associates. Uh, we all remain uh, mindful of the extraordinary circumstances the global financial system faced in late 2008 the assistance we received to complete the Merrill merger, and the commitments we made at that time uh, to the American taxpayers. Uh, we look forward to fulfilling uh, that, those commitments and to ensuring that the Bank of America and Merrill Lynch continue to provide exceptional value to our customers and our investors. I uh, also am pleased to answer any questions you may have today. Thank you, very, thank you very much. Let me thank all of you for your, your testimony. Um, let me begin with you, um, Mr. Myopoulos. On December the 1st, 2008, did you tell Bank of America C CFO Joe Price that you did not think Bank of America could back out of the Merrill Lynch deal invoking the MAC? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I gave that advice. Were you fired nine days after giving that advice? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I was. Do you know why you were fired? No, Mr. Chairman, I don't know why I was fired. I don't know whether it had anything to do with the advice I gave or might give or whether it had to do with something else. I don't know why I was fired. I wasn't given an explanation. Did you at any point have a conversation with Ken Lewis talking about your role after the merger of Bank of America and Merrill Lynch? Did at any point did they talk to you about what your role would be after that? Yes, Mr. Chairman, on the evening that we negotiated the Merrill Lynch merger, Mr. Lewis told me personally that I would be the general counsel of the combined company following the merger. But it didn't happen? No, sir, it didn't. Right. Uh, let me just move forward to you, Mr. Moynihan. Uh, just to make sure I'm clear, did anyone in the government force Bank of America to go through with this deal? Uh, no, sir. No one in the government? No, sir. We know much more now about the MAC. 
and this entire deal than we did last summer. If you believe there was something material about the Merrill, Merrill deal that made you want to back out of it, why didn't you think it was material to the average American who was thinking about buying some of your stock and disclosing it publicly? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, when I uh, became uh, general counsel and we worked and looked at the $18 billion loss that we were facing at Merrill Lynch, uh, we believed we had a valid claim for a MAC. The disclosure requirements uh, would arise when we had a duty to disclose those, which was later when we announced our earnings in January. Being you sitting next to Mr. Myopoulos, let me ask you a question. Did you think he was a good lawyer? Uh, yes, being you sitting sir. next to him. Yeah, yes, sir, I did. Think Tim was good general counsel. I, I'm sorry, Mixon. Yes, I did. Think he was a good general counsel. Do you think it made sense to fire someone who had been the top lawyer for the previous five years, especially right in the middle of one of the biggest deals in Bank of America's history. Didn't you feel uncomfortable with that? Uh, Mr. Chairman, the, the times that we were going through in December 2008 was we were downsizing the company relatively dramatically, and we were changing 10 percent of our executives uh, were terminated, and, which is terrible things and terrible times to go through, but part of the economic stress. And the changes that were made as best I, uh, I know, were made us in the context of us uh, changing the numbers of senior executives we had because of the economic stress we were under. It's a tough thing to go through, but it's uh, part of being about business, and, and I think it's, uh, it's clear that that's what drove the decision. Yeah. I just wanted you to repeat one thing. There's some question about the government's involvement here. Uh, the government did not pressure you at any point to do anything that you did not want to do? I did not uh, personally feel at any point uh, pressure by the government to do something that was not in the best interest of our shareholders. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Gifford, the committee has obtained two emails you sent regarding the Bank of America's deal with Merrill Lynch. In one of those emails, you used the phrase, screw the shareholders. Screw the shareholders. And the other, you expressed disagreement with the way Bank of America approved mergers. Can you tell us any more about what you had in mind when you wrote those emails? Is there anything else you could tell us? Uh, yeah, yeah, I can, Mr. Chairman. I'm obviously not terribly proud of the uh, choice of words, uh, to be sure. Uh, the, the, the first reference to an email was, as I recall, uh, the middle of January. And it, it happened uh, during the middle of a board meeting in an exchange with a very good friend, and we were being rather informal, as the words might suggest. And we were going back and forth, and it was during that meeting that uh, we were announcing earnings for January, for the fourth quarter in the year, uh, which were certainly unsatisfactory, and we knew would have a very negative effect, effect on share price. Uh, we also eliminated the dividend down to a penny. What I was doing, I'm a, for, for me, my holdings in Bank of America are very significant for me and my family. And so the, it, it, the, you took it a little out of context. The actual expression or the actual line was, unfortunately, it's also screw the shareholders. I don't like saying that word in a public forum. Uh, and I was express, what I was doing is expressing remorse for all shareholders. Right. Let me just ask this very quickly before we move on. Um, Mr. May and, of course, um, uh, and Mr. Gifford, uh, Ken Lewis told this committee that he and the board ultimately decided to go through with the Merrill deal because it was a, in the best interest of the company. Do you agree that buying Merrill Lynch was in the best interest of Bank of America? Uh, yes, I do, sir. Back in, back in September, when the board was first presented with this opportunity, uh, after many probing questions, I might add, because these were difficult times, it was not a, uh, if you will, a slam dunk transaction, but in my opinion, the long-term strategic benefits were such that I voted for the transaction. Uh, I also voted for the transaction and uh, to this day still feel that it is a, a tremendous combination of, of, of two uh, wonderful companies. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you both for uh, your, your doing your fiduciary duty. I'm sure it was not easy as 10, 10 then $18 billion of unexpected losses piled up at a company in the middle of a merger. 
I've done a few acquisitions in my day and uh, still sit on the board of my company. And uh, uh, I wouldn't want to try to decide whether to pull the trigger or not pull the trigger with so many people on both sides, and particularly at a time when Secretary Paulson, President Bush himself were, uh, were up here on the Hill telling us it was a crisis and if we didn't vote money in a matter of hours, uh, the world as we know it was going to come to an end. Uh, and of course, as you know, the world as you know it never comes to an end in Washington because we just print money. We've had no layoffs. Mr. Monahan, it won't surprise you, but government has grown net by 139,000 new employees just since this administration took office. Uh, we don't feel your pain. But let me go through a couple of, uh, of uh, set the record straight. If we could put up slide one. Uh, slide one, when it gets up there, it's hard to read, but uh, it says, before formally call Mac, get government in. Geithner gone on vacation. This is from Eric Roth, B of A lawyer. Then slide two. Fire board if you do it. Tim G agrees. Larry Summer and Tim agree. This is from Joe Price, one of your uh, CFO of the company. Slide three. Hank Paulson made it clear that Treasury and the Fed were prepared to deliver an assistance package. Hank made it clear that he had concurrence of the Fed and Tim Geithner and others. Ben also stated that Geithner and, in addition, Larry Summers were both on board with this transaction. Those, Mr. Chairman, are the words of Ken Lewis. Slide four. Ben says 45 billion TARP available if necessary. Obama team informed and agrees. Tommy Franks, B of A board member. Slide five, not here today, of course. Slide five. Incoming team at Fed and Treasury in agreement. This is from another board member not here, Tim Sloan of the, your board. Slide five. Paulson, I'm sorry, slide six. Paulson and Bernanke spoke to Geithner. You have our commitment that this will be resolved. You will get some additional investment. Eric Roth, B of A lawyer. Questions for you gentlemen. None of these are in dispute here today. None of the testimony that we've had up until now disputes the fact that in various ways then Fed Chairman or uh, then Fed uh, New York Bank Chairman uh, Tim Geithner was in the loop because this was after he was uh, the likely and, and in fact uh, now is the Secretary. Knowing all of this, do you believe today that if the money had not been made available, and this is for the board members primarily, in the form of a loan or in the ca this case a loan through preferred stock with interest, do you believe that you would have likely pulled the MAC and disputed going through with the deal at the current cost based on the $18 billion in losses? And Mr. Gifford, particularly, I'd like, uh, I'd like you to answer that since your career has been in banking. If you take $18 billion out of your balance sheet and then try not to have the FDIC come in and take you out, uh, isn't that a real concern that you would have had to deal with? Uh, the, uh, uh, Ranking Member Issa, the, uh, it, it was a confusing time for sure. Uh, I, I can tell you that as we learned, uh, we the Board, uh, originally on December 19th of the growing and sig very significant losses at Merrill Lynch, uh, management to present to the board the opportunity to exercise the privileges of, of a MAC, a Material Adverse Change Clause, and get out of the transaction because of the uh, how much damage uh, had been, uh, if you will, invoked on, on Merrill Lynch. It became, he, we then talked later with Mr. Uh, with Mr. Lewis, we being the board, a few days later, and uh, he expressed the fact that the government thought it would be a major mistake uh, for us to walk away. They thought it would be a systemic, very dangerous systemically and very dangerous and not, not positive at all for the Bank of And America. let me just interrupt you. Did he express that if you walked away from it and then needed help later, the Fed wasn't going to be there for you? No, he didn't. He, didn't. he, expressed, the, the, he expressed the sentiment, and there was a, another session later in the month, that the government would provide financing. There was, there, there was nothing in writing but it was from very senior officials of the, of the, of the government that uh, 
one would believe would follow through. The details were not reviewed uh, with the board. I can, I can tell you, from, uh, as a member of the board of director, I can only re uh, speak uh, as one person, uh, the, the issue was relatively clear to me. Uh, it, in, in a perfect world, it would have been better to walk away. Sure. One last question for the two of you very quickly. As CEOs, as business leaders who have had general counsels, don't you normally require two things? Your general counsel give you an honest statement, which you, you take his legal advice, but don't you need to have at all times a general counsel who's on board with your leadership decisions? Uh, a, a, a general counsel who's on board with our leadership decisions? In other words, would you, would you keep a general counsel who's constantly telling you not to do what you've already decided to do from a business standpoint? Well, I, I, I mean, any member of the board has to make up their own mind. Uh, you would like to be in a position to believe your general, general, general counsel is going to provide good counsel. Mr. May? Yep. Uh, I, I agree with that uh, and totally. Gentleman's time has expired. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Ohio, Congressman Kucinich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I ask unanimous consent to uh, enter into the record documents that will be part of this uh, question. Without objection, period. so ordered. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayopoulos, as general counsel at Bank of America, you determined whether or not the bank made additional disclosures to shareholders to update its proxy solicitation. What threshold of quarterly losses would have led you to recommend additional disclosure to shareholders before the vote? Wasn't that threshold anything above a $10 billion forecast quarterly loss? Uh, Congressman, um, the historical experience at Merrill Lynch over the prior four quarters that it had quarterly losses ranging from $2 billion to $10 billion. Uh, certainly, as you got to $10 billion or higher in after-tax losses, I think the case for disclosure became much more compelling. You state in your testimony that you received a copy of a forecast dated November 12th, and that the information in it played a role in your legal deliberation about making additional disclosure about the financial situation at Merrill Lynch. Uh, let's look at the November 12th forecast you received. Our staff has already provided uh, the gentleman with a copy of what we're talking about here. Merrill Lynch's most illiquid and volatile assets, the collateralized debt obligations, the credit default swaps, and subprime mortgage-backed securities were tracked in the rows marked significant items, total marks. Now, if you follow that across the column entitled BTG, which stands for balance to go, or the estimate of performance for the remainder of the quarter, uh, in that gray highlighted box, they're blank. There are no numbers there, is that correct? I don't see any numbers there, sir. Okay. So there's no projection for collateralized debt obligations and other illiquid assets that were losing a lot of money at that time. When my staff asked Merrill Lynch's CFO, whose team produced this spreadsheet, why a forecast would contain no projections for these assets, he told us that this document was not intended to be a valid forecast despite its title. Uh, Mr. Mayopoulos, did you notice that omission and did you ever question whether or not the November 12 forecast document was a valid forecast? Representative, uh, no one ever told me that this was not a valid forecast. I was uh, informed. So that's a no? That's a no. I was never okay, told it was I, not. Well I, well, I need to move on here. I want you to look at the bottom margin of the page. Those notes we, uh, were added, we understand, by Bank of America's treasurer to the Merrill Lynch forecast document on the morning of November 13th. They were intended to help fill in the omission noted above. Can you read those lines aloud? There's a line that says um, minus 075 Alt A from OCI to PNL. Okay, I'm referring to the line that says Neil Gut question mark. Well, was your understanding at the time? <coughs> Could you, do, you, do you see that? Yes, sir, all? I do. Okay, so what was your understanding at the time? Was that a reference to Neil Cotty's gut feeling? I don't remember discussing that specifically. I do recall being informed that there was a $1 billion contingency in this $5 billion forecast, and that seems to correspond to the Neil Gut line there. Well, when my uh, staff interviewed Mr. Cotty, he said that the November 12 forecast was of questionable validity. He also said that he did not have time to delve deeply into the details of the forecast. Did you know that Mr. Cotty had not delved deeply into the details of the forecast 
before a billion dollar guess no, called sir. Neil's gut was added to it? No, sir. Did the words Neil's gut create any concern, any concern in your mind at all that it might be a number pulled out of the air, a, a gut feeling? I understood that this forecast was in part a guess, that it was an okay. estimate. Okay, so it was in part a guess. My understanding is you did not transmit the November 12th document to the attorneys at Wachtell Lipton. The record portrays you, sir, as the individual who relayed the relevant financial information to your outside counsel. Do you recall telling the Wachtell attorneys on November 12th and 13th that the October losses were $7 billion and that Merrill Lynch could break even in November, allowing you to spread October's loss, allowing you to spread October's losses over two months. No, sir, I don't recall that. But but if you look at if you look at the documents here, you are uh, are quoted, uh, and to members of the committee, uh, as uh, uh, as saying that in a conversation with Nicholas Demo, uh, that you said that uh, uh, that Merrill Lynch lost. $7 billion so far in October, how do we get the number out? And that also, in the meeting notes of Wachtell Lipton attorneys, uh, your comments are mentioned again uh, relating to, um, uh, to the $7 uh, billion dollar number. Uh, now, when you spoke with your attorneys at Wachtell Lipton, did you recall telling them that the fourth quarter forecast received from Merrill Lynch omitted November-December projections for CDO, CDS, and subprime mortgage-backed securities which alone lost seven billion, seven, six point four billion in October? No, sir. I recall telling them that I had received a forecast from the finance department and I described for them what the uh, bottom line numbers were. Uh, Mr. Mayopolis, do you happen to know what the quarterly loss for Merrill Lynch turned out to be? For the fourth quarter, my understanding was approximately $15.3 billion after taxes. Well, in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, in other words, the actual loss is acknowledged just two weeks after the shareholder vote were well above the thre threshold that would have led you to recommend additional disclosure. In fact, if Bank of America had simply extrapolated October's losses into November and December, you would have come pretty close to the actual magnitude of losses for the quarter. But neither Merrill Lynch nor Bank of America did that or any financial analysis at all. Mr. Chairman, they relied on someone's gut feeling. Yeah. Yield mm -hmm. back. Thank you very much. Uh, and I yield five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me, uh, let me uh, just try to tell the story the way I see it unfolding. So last, last fall, you're, you make a decision and circumstances such that you're going to acquire Merrill. In the midst of all that, the TARP bill passes. Uh, through our testimony we got from Mr. Lewis earlier this year, he indicated nine days after TARP passes, the biggest financial institutions are brought to Washington. Uh, they are told they need to accept TARP money. He makes a call to board members and decides to, to do that. In the midst of all this last fall, you uh, look to exercise the MAC to, in my judgment, put more pressure on Merrill because you see they're losing more than, than you initially thought. Uh, you want to get a better deal, what two businesses do all the time. The government said no to that. In fact, uh, based on testimony we've heard, even though Mr. Moynihan, in answering the chairman's uh, question, uh, said differently, and based on what we've heard, there was some kind of at least subtle pressure placed on Bank of America to go through with uh, the deal. In fact, we have the letter from Attorney General Cuomo, which suggests that, says that Mr. Lewis and the board would be gone if, in fact, uh, they did not follow through on the Merrill uh, deal. You sought assurances, as Mr. Issa pointed out in his questioning, from the incoming uh, players, uh, likely players in an Obama administration. You actually sought them in writing. They said they wouldn't put anything in writing, but our assumption is you got some kind of verbal assurances to proceed uh, further with, with this. Uh, so let me just ask a couple questions. Is that, in fact, the case that you, you received uh, assurances in some form, other than writing, from the likely folks to be involved in the Obama administration at, at, the, uh, at the Treasury Department, um, that if, in fact, things got worse, they would be there with additional TARP dollars to, uh, to help uh, Bank of America. And we can go right down the list. And I'd like a yes or no to that, if, I, if we could. Mr. Moynihan, we'll start uh, with you. I don't, the, we received a, uh, statements from the uh, current Secretary Paulson and Chairman Bernanke that as we work through from mid-December in the two weeks we had to work through it, that, that if we went forward that we could, uh, would receive some sort of assistance, which we finally negotiated and actually closed in January of 2009. 
Uh, as to the yes. statements of the incoming administration, I think Mr. Lewis uh, has testified to that, that he, in his conversations with those people, he was told that they un had heard about the transaction. I was not part of those discussions. Yeah, so I just want to be clear. Was there a promise made from the, from the incoming Obama administration that they would be there to back you up if, in fact, that's what Bank of America needed? The, I, I don't know that because I, I was only told what Mr. Lewis's conversation Mr. was, which I assume. <laughs> Mr. Gifford? I was aware of no such promise. Mr. May? Mr. Mayopolis? I was aware of no such promise. Okay. Neither was I. Were you aware of assurances? I mean, something, something short of the word promise, were you aware of that? Uh, I, I, as I understood it from our, from our chief executive, he was told, or a lot of he told, he told, that uh, uh, the- And he related that to you? He related that to okay. us, that the new members, the new, new administration were aware of the discussions. Okay. Not Mr. May, would you agree with that? We, we were being apprised uh, pretty regularly of the progress that was being made from our, the okay. mid let me, December Okay. Let, let me move to the, to the end of the story here, at least what, what we hope is, is the end. Um, kind of cut to the chase of where we are today. How much TARP money has Bank of America received? We've received uh, $45 billion in total. $45 billion. And what is your cash position today? You've said, all of you said this was a good deal. It's worked out for the shareholders. You know, wonderful apple pie. God bless America. The whole thing. So what's your cash position today? Our cash position is uh, in excess of uh, around $150 to $200 billion. Have you, uh, have, you, uh, have you paid back the TARP money? We have not paid it back yet. We've been clear that our uh, goal is to pay it back as soon as possible. And why haven't you paid it back, Mr. Moynihan? The, as last week, they issued a, a series. Uh, the uh, federal government issued a series of requirements to pay it back, and we're looking at those. In have you asked the federal government to pay it back? Yes or no? Uh, it's not. Uh, have you got permission? I mean, uh, well, uh, is there? What's preventing you? You got a 150 billion dollar cash uh, positive cash position, and you owe the taxpayers of this country 45 billion dollars. Why hasn't it paid back? It, uh, as you, you could look at the guidelines, it takes a series of steps and a series of requests and answers. If you yeah. could, would you pay it back? If we could, yes, we would pay it back. We've been clear of our intention to pay it back. As soon and as is there, is there, in your judgment, are there hindrances or uh, hindrances or obstacles that the Obama administration is putting in place that are preventing you from paying it back? I, I think the the question that they're that the government's looking at this is to make sure we can all stabilize the economy, which was the intention. And I think we've, as I said earlier, we've done a pretty good job of doing that, as have our colleagues that receive the money. And I think- In, in your professional judgment, why, why, I mean, why, why, why the hindrances? Why can't you get that money back to the, to the federal government pay back the taxpayers? I, I think the, we just have to be assured that if we do that, then the economy is in the kind of shape and, the, and for a company like ours, which supports America and around the world businesses that we can. Would you agree that, in fact, of October, we had that we ran the highest deficit in single month deficit in American history last fiscal year, ran the highest single annual deficit in American yeah. history. Wouldn't you think that the new administration would want that money to get back into the Treasury and help with, with that situation? I think you'd have to ask them that our intention would be paid. The gentleman's back. time has yeah. expired. Yeah. yeah. Let me ask all of you to pull your mic closer. We have some senior citizens up here having trouble hearing. <laughs> yes, I yield to the gentleman from uh, Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Uh, Monahan, I find your testimony very troubling. And um, I don't know who you think we are, but. Uh, I, I got to tell you, I find some of the things that you've said not uh, believable. Um, first of all, the chairman uh, asked you why uh, Mr. Myopoulos was, was fired. A seasoned attorney was fired nine days after he gave an opinion, and you basically said you all suddenly got into downsizing fever. Is that right? Is that basically what you're saying? You were downsizing? I said I wasn't personally involved in the decision, but it was in the context of... Well, you replaced him, didn't you? Yes, I did. And what were you told, what did they tell you, and I remind you that you're under oath, was the reason why he was fired? Uh, Ken asked me to take the job as general counsel, and I said I would take I'm that. sorry, say that again? Uh, Mr. Lewis asked me to take the job as general counsel, and I, I said I would take the job. You didn't answer my question. I said, were well, you told you're replacing somebody, you hadn't practiced in years, and you're replacing somebody who's a seasoned attorney who had just given an opinion uh, that apparently Mr. Lewis did not like, or others did not like, and you mean you're walking into a job and you didn't say, well, what happened to the last guy? 
I mean, th that's a logical question. Th that's absolutely a logical question. And I, what did and what did you did you find out? Did you ask the question first of all, or did you know? I didn't ask the question, and I went about doing. Uh, so you didn't care, right? I cared that Mr. My office as a person, obviously, but I, I had to. Get, I met with this director Ports and started my job. And if you were advising a client the size of Bank America, what would you say to the management if they told you they wanted to fire their in-house counsel and replace him with a senior business executive who, while a credentialed uh, and experienced attorney, had not practiced law in 10 years and was not even licensed at the time, uh, would you advise them to make that move? I think if the decision was made for me to uh, be general counsel, I think it was a wise move on behalf of the company, and I was competent to do it. That's very interesting. Now, let me ask you this. Um, you had an opportunity to talk to our committee staff, did you not? Yes, I did, sir. And you uh, believe that there was a MAC, a MAC, a MAC was appropriate, there was a case for a MAC, is that right? I believe we had a valid claim. For and at the case. time that you talked to the committee staff, you uh, produced no evidence with regard to uh, why you had that opinion. Do you have any evidence today? Uh, Representative, the evidence is that in the fourth quarter of 2008, Merrill Lynch lost $21 billion pre-tax, and it was not clear that they'd be able to use the tax benefits. That was twice as much as they'd ever made as a company, and completely depleted their capital by 50 percent. And so therefore, that was a material change in their circumstances. Their now, ability to earn money at the level they were supposed to was impaired by their capital have going down. Now that was uh, inconsistent with the law firm uh, Wachtell and what Mr. Myopolis had said, is that right? Was that inconsistent? I, I in other words, you all, had, you all had hired a big law firm, and you had a general counsel. And then you come in, you haven't practiced law in 10 years, and you come along and say, ah, oh, I think this is a good time, but the Mac is fine. So I'm trying to figure out, uh, how'd you get there? I, I relied on Wachtell Lipton, who was of the same opinion. We had a valid claim for Mac and informed as such. I also relied on my experience in dealing MAC clauses and having taken apart deals for MAC clauses in my experience in the past, the hundreds of deals I've done as an attorney and a business person. Hey. And, and we were all of the same opinion, that this was at $21 billion in losses, this was a material change in the circumstance of Merrill Lynch that uh, we had to address. Well, let me get to Mr. Myopoulos, because apparently he had a different opinion. Is that what Wachtell had said, uh, Mr. My Myopoulos? He says that, that they were all in agreement. Is that right? That's not what they told you, is it? We didn't have any conversations. I didn't have any conversations with Wachtell about the material adverse change clause. All righty. Now, Mr. G uh, Gifford, this is, you gotta, this is the fellow, Mr. Moynihan is one of the people that you are considering to take Mr. Lewis's place. Is that right? That's what I read in the newspaper, sir. That's what you read in the newspaper. What do you mean? Uh, we, we, we have tried very hard, Congressman uh, Cummings, not to be talking publicly about individuals. Well, the fact is, the reason why I'm talking about it is, is this the guy, I'm just trying to figure out, is this the guy that we've got to face uh, when, when, when we are trying to deal with Bank of America, when we've got $45 billion invested in a company? I'm just trying to figure out, is this the face that we are going to be facing? And I'm responding. Congress. And I'm not asking you for your decision. I'm just asking, is he a, is one of your top candidates? Uh, he is a very talented executive at Bank of America. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I now yield to Mr. Lukemeyer from Missouri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to follow along this line of questioning. Uh, Mr. Meropoulos, uh, in uh, our documents here, it indicates that you informed Mr. Price that uh, Bank of America did not have the basis for invoking a MAC. What was your basis of that decision? The basis of that decision was that uh, in order for there to be a material adverse change, there had to be an event that had occurred that had a disproportionate impact on Merrill Lynch in contrast to other companies in the industry, including Bank of America. And as I discussed with Mr. Price, uh, the stock price of Bank of America had declined uh, almost as much as uh, Merrill Lynch's. Merrill Bank of America had gone, gone out and raised substantial capital, it had cut its dividend, its earnings had been reduced. So basically, both companies had suffered significant downturns in their prospects in the time since the merger had been announced. Was the information that you had, uh, did you not have the information that Mr. Moynihan had with regards to the uh, $21 billion loss? at the time that you made your, your uh, advisory opinion to uh, Mr. Price? That's correct. I did not have that information. Okay. If you'd have known that, what, what would your advice have been at that time? 
I believe my advice would have been, although I don't have all the information that the company had at that time since I was gone, but my view would have been that invoking material adverse change clause would be a dangerous and risky prospect, uh, but I, I didn't have the information and I didn't study that question. So what, so what you're saying is you would have gone along with saying that the, uh, the, the MAC would have been a very viable way of uh, uh, go ahead and invoke MAC then? No, sir, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that I think it would be a very uh, difficult decision to invoke the material adverse change clause. I believe I would, would have suggested that the company sit down with Merrill Lynch and try to renegotiate price, but if that didn't work, I don't know that I would have uh, threatened uh, to uh, invoke the material adverse change clause. Well, do you believe then that the reason that uh, the MAC was eventually then used as a bargaining chip, or was it used as a bargaining chip in your, in your judgment to uh, extract a better price from the government? Congressman, I don't know what, what it was used for. I, wasn't, I, I was never privy to any of the discussions. I was gone. Okay. Um, along this line also, obviously, during, in a lot of our documentation here and in the testimony, uh, there's the, uh, the threat to fire uh, Mr. Lewis as well as the entire board. Um, can you tell me or any of you, any of you gentlemen can tell me the circumstances under which they, number one, had the authority to do that, and number two, the circumstances under which they believed that you as a board or as Mr. Lewis as chairman uh, were doing something wrong that they could fire you for? Well, I think we've, uh, the discussion about that is, I think, reflective of the very serious uh, circumstances that we faced in December 2008. Um, the economy was in a total uh, disarray. They're going to fire you for the economy? It, it, the, the economy was in disarray. They, uh, the regulators were serious about us thinking about the pros and cons and our, using our judgment uh, around the MAC and what we would do as a company. And I think what I always took that as a view of how serious the situation and how serious they wanted to think about it. We were prepared, if it was the right interest for our shareholders, to exercise the MAC irrespective of what would happen to, to management, and I assume Mr. Gifford and Mr. May would say the board. Unfortunately, Mr. Monahan, that, that, that answer does not fly with me. You cannot tell me that Bank of America is going to that cause our entire economy to go down if you don't do this because that they're going to replace your entire board and the chairman. You expect me to believe that? I'm, the, the point, I think, was that would we feel that if we had to be removed, if the government uh, said that we had to be removed, we, that did not factor into our decision. So of basically what they were extorting did. your decision to go along and accept Merrill Lynch as, as, a, as a partner, business partner. Is that what you're saying? What I said was that we did not let that factor in our decision of what the best interest of our shareholders was. If I may respond as a member yeah. of the board, Congressman Lickemeyer, uh, <coughs> excuse me, we heard on, a, I believe it was December 22nd, the CEO reporting to the board uh, that uh, the government, Secretary Paulson, had made it clear that the government felt very strongly that this transaction should continue. It was in the best interest of uh, the American financial system, as well as Bank of America. Uh, and we also heard the comment, and if it doesn't happen, uh, there is a risk to members of the board and management keeping their jobs. I can assure you, sir, uh, as much as I care about the American financial system, our job is representing shareholders. And that did not one iota factor in the decision that I and I believe my cohorts made in proceeding with the transaction. To do so would be uh, just directly dishonoring our fiduciary duty. And we made that clear in our discussions at the board. Okay, I got one more quick question before my time expires. Um, obviously, uh, Mr. Warnhan, you testified that they lost 21 billion, Merrill Lynch lost $21 billion. Can you tell me what the problems were or why they lost that money and have those problems been rectified now that you, um, that Bank of America owns the company? The the, uh, the problems were uh, due to the markdowns of securities and other things that were going on in December of 2008 as the markets continue to deteriorate. Uh, they are rectified because Merrill Lynch makes money, but the context of that is Merrill Lynch being owned by Bank of America with a stable capital base and ability to keep its balance sheet is now able to produce the kind of money and do the kinds of things for our customers which are strong. Uh, but in, in uh, uh, December 2008, that's what not. Do they still on. involve themselves in a lot of the investment uh, derivatives type activity that caused a lot of the problems? They continue to trade with the clients. I think a lot of the quote legacy positions that you hear people talk about uh, uh, are not being renewed or running off as we speak. Um, but uh, I think it's a much uh, simp uh, straight, more straightforward, clear, and less risky uh, platform than it was as a standalone company due to the stability and, and capabilities of Bank of America and Merrill Lynch together have. 
The gentleman's time okay. has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I yield five minutes to the gentleman from Massachusetts, Congressman Turney. Thank you, Mr. Towns. Mr. Gifford, at what point in time did you become aware that uh, Mr. Mayopoulos was being uh, relieved of his duties and that Mr. Moynihan was assuming a role as general counsel? Uh, I believe, Congressman Turney, it was the afternoon of December 9th. Sorry, I believe it was the afternoon of December 9th following oh. a board meeting. Okay, so that was the day before he actually had the unceremoniously, uh, the unceremonious firing incident. I, having just heard the December 10th, yes. Okay. Can you tell us what was discussed when you learned uh, that he was being fired and that Mr. Moynihan was being hired? Uh, the, uh, I and the rest of the board, Congressman, were inf was informed at the end of that December 9 board meeting uh, that Mr. Moynihan was leaving the company uh, because of, uh, he, he wasn't able to take a job that the CEO wanted him to take. Uh, a number of board members ver within a couple of minute time frame expressed regret because, uh, as I said earlier in the testimony, uh, Mr. Moynihan is one of the most talented executives I've ever worked with. Uh, and we expressed that regret to uh, the chief executive officer. At that point, uh, I and a bunch of others that uh, live in Boston got on a plane and went back to Boston. Uh, got, went back to Boston. I, at that point, thought Mr. I uh, knew nothing about uh, Tim. Uh, all, all I knew was that uh, Brian was leaving the company. Uh, when I returned to Boston, uh, I got a, sometime late afternoon an email, as did all members of the board, from the, Ken Lewis, the chief executive officer, informing him that, uh, that uh, Brian was staying in, uh, in, in Bank of America and becoming general counsel. Thank you. Mr. May, were you privy to that same set of facts, the same conversations? Yes, I was. That, uh, that day uh, at the board meeting, we found out that uh, Brian was, uh, was leaving the company. Um, I did express to Ken Lewis a concern about that because of his um, versatility. Uh, I indicated he can play third base, he can catch, he can pitch. We've had him in almost every aspect of the business, whether it was wealth management, whether it was investment banking, or whether it was in legal. And um, uh, we were happy to hear that he had found a solution. Again, you have to recall that this was at a time when a merger was going on. And so uh, you, we don't usually w use the word fired during mergers, but positions are eliminated. You have two treasurers, you have two controllers, you have two presidents, and uh, things were being eliminated and uh, the, 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 the you don't top want management to organization really think was shrinking. This all happened in the context of the merger and you were shuffling positions around uh, just at that critical moment. Uh, that instead of waiting until after the transaction was completed by the uh, board, then you're going to shake out? You it, wanted to think that while that was going on, you decided to do all that? This, this abso absolutely was happening. Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Moynihan had been in investment banking. He was leading the Bank of America Investment Bank. The merger with Merrill Lynch eliminated his, not eliminated his position, but uh, someone else was chosen to lead the investment bank, and Brian was asked to go to the credit card business in Wilmington. Uh, that was a job that he turned down. We were going to potentially leave him. So yes, sir, he was, he was a, a victim of a merger synergy. So how long did he hold this job of uh, general counsel after, he, uh, after it was decided that he had to have that job? Uh, I'm not sure the exact name. 44 uh, a couple days? Of months, something like that, yes, sir. So it doesn't strike you as incongruous that you give him a position for 44 days, that holds him onto the company, and then you shuffle him off to where supposedly he didn't want to go to begin with? Uh, again, that's the fragility of an organization that is going through transition, and there was fallout. There were people that left Merrill, uh, that were Merrill, former Merrill executives that left the combined company, and we were fortunate to have Brian to put him into some of these holes. Mr. Mayopoulos, didn't Mr. Moynihan tell you that you were going to be the general counsel of the emerged entities? Yes, sir, he did. Did you believe him when he told you that? Yes, I did. Mr. Moynihan, did you tell Mr. Mayopoulos that he was going to be the general counsel of the combined units? Uh, yes. And why did you lie to him? I, at, at the time, he was the general counsel. He was one of four or five uh, different uh, people I had working for me, 35, 40,000 associates, and he was the general counsel. And you believed that he was uh, uh, capable of doing the job? Absolutely. So then tell me why it was that a man that you believed to be capable of doing the job got bounced out in the fashion that he did. You know, why did he get fired? Congressman, I know this is uh, difficult, but in, in, in the business world, this happens. When I took the job, to run the Merrill Lynch, uh, Combined Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Global Bank and Wealth Management. The person who had that job left that day also. Um, we have to make decisions. It's very difficult economic times. And a decision was made to eliminate 10% of the senior executives. And one of the outcomes of that decision was a change between Tim and I. It's not 
great for people. Uh, and I know it's hard to understand if you're outside business, but in these tough times, those are the things that happen. And the fact that it happened just a matter of days after he told Mr. Lewis that, uh, Mr. Price at least, that the MAC wasn't a, an option, has nothing to do with it. I, I no knowledge that had anything to do with it. My time is up. Thank you very much. I, I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Chow. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And this is my question, uh, I would assume, to the members of the board and maybe even to Mr. Moynihan. Uh, I've heard your statement saying how good the acquisition of Merrill Lynch is to Bank of America. My question to you here is, if I were to ask you to compare Bank of America now without the purchase of Merrill Lynch with the Bank of America with the purchase of Merrill Lynch, which of the two would be a stronger institution today? I think from a ability to serve customer standpoint, there's no doubt we're a stronger institution today with the product capabilities we have, not only in the U.S., but around the world to serve customers, whether they're an individual, uh, a small business, a large business, uh, acro investor across the world. The capabilities we have when you put these two companies together are better than the capabilities either one had before they came here. And do you have, for example, any kind of... Um profit studies with respect to Bank of America without Merrill Lynch and Bank of America with Merrill Lynch? I mean, the, the eggs are scrambled at this point in terms of uh, the decisions we've made, so it's hard to separate it. But just to give you a sense, uh, the legacy Bank of America investment banking platform would have been, you know, maybe five, six in some businesses and two or three in other parts of that business. Now we've, been, we've received the second highest amount of investment banking fees every quarter this year, second to J.P. Morgan and ahead of every other investment banking firm you can name. And so that shows you that the combination together is, is more than Bank of America had in that business. I could do that and go through every one of the businesses, whether it's the 15,000 financial advisors, uh, whether it's uh, what we have in the sales trading, investment banking capability. It's, all that's true, true, and it happens in every business. We are better now today than we were as two separate companies. Now, knowing that a company would, uh, were to face um, a loss of billions of dollars, was the... Um, $45 billion in TARP money, was that one of the reasons why Bank of America were, uh, purchased uh, Merrill Lynch? I think you have to separate the, uh, the, the TARP money that we received, for lack of better terms, or irrespective of the, of the transaction, would have been the 25, and then we got 20 in connection with the transaction to help handle the losses uh, that Merrill Lynch had in December, t in the fourth quarter of 2008, and particularly in the latter half of that. So um, I think it's, I think. The investment helped stabilize the economy, stabilize the financial system. If Merrill Lynch would have failed, it would have been a complete surprise at that point and would have wreaked uh, a damage on the whole system. It would have hurt our company just because of we're a participant in the markets. And so I think the 20 Is the answer yes or no? Is, was it factored in the $45 billion in TARP money? The, the, uh, the, the 20 billion relates to Merrill Lynch transaction. The other stuff doesn't relate to anything. It was done before Merrill Lynch uh, transaction closed. Now, did I hear correctly that you are one of the potential candidates to replace Mr. Ken Lewis pursuant to the questions of uh, Congressman Cummings? I, I think you heard that, Mr. That, that, that's time. probably not a, a question for Mr. Moynihan, Congressman Cow. Well, would, that would be a question to you, Mr. Kiffey. Uh, okay, sir. Uh, <clears throat> we are trying, and it's very difficult, with the visibility of Bank of America to keep the selection process confidential. Uh, for I think for obvious reasons. It's very difficult for us when, when uh, presumed candidates appear in the press. It makes it difficult for their current jobs. Let me ask you another question. Um, I, I, I am trying to say, as I did uh, as best I could to uh, Congressman Cummings, that we are not disclosing publicly those that we are considering. Uh, so based on what I've heard so far, you are saying that Mr. Ken Lewis is not doing a very good job? I hope I didn't imply that, sir. If he's not in, if, if he were to not do, if he's, if he's, if he, I'm sorry, if he is doing a good job, why would you want to replace him? Uh, Mr. Lewis announced two months ago that he wished to retire at the end of this year. Okay. That's what prompted this search. Uh, that's all the questions I have. Wait, Mr. Uh, would the gentleman yield? Uh, yes, please. Thank you. Uh, just following up on that, uh, the, the question earlier from Mr. Jordan, you have $100 billion plus dollars in the bank. If it were not for the regulatory rules of how much capital you have, 
would you in the ordinary course of business pay back the $45 billion? And I am going to caveat it in a way that Mr. Jordan didn't. If you could get it back tomorrow, would you pay it back today? In other words, is, is the only reason you are not paying it back that if you pay it back, it can't come back out again? And Mr. Ma uh, Moynihan? I don't, I don't think I meant to say that. What I am saying is No, I just I want to try to get it straight. You have got the money. You would pay the government. You would happily pay the government. If you, quote, were later deemed to need it and it was a line of credit, you would pay it back. The only reason you are not paying it back today is the government has put hurdles in your way to prove that you can not only pay it back, but you can still pass a stress test. Isn't that right? Uh, Mr. Issa, our, our goal is to pay this back and return the money to taxpayers. No, I, I appreciate that, uh, but Mr. It, Jordan didn't get the answer from you that, I, that I've asked. Right. The fact is you have the money. In the ordinary course, if it were just another creditor, you would pay it back. The, uh, the, uh, there are regulatory questions the government has put up, and there are questions about quote, capital provisions. But notwithstanding that, you are not putting that money to use today. For Mr. Cummings and others, you are not loaning that money out. It is cash. You would pay it back in the or if there were not hurdles to cross. Isn't that correct? I, I think, I think the, the, you are talking about a cost of $2.3 trillion balance sheet. We have cash. You asked me what our cash balance was. I told you. The fact of the matter is, is money is fungible. So this capital provides our ability to lend uh, to help support our balance sheet. So, it, so it, is a, it is a balance sheet question, but the fact is, for the Board, you would pay this money back in the ordinary course if it were just We have stated bill. publicly, uh, Ranking Member Issa, that we would like to pay back TARP. The Thank board, you. The the board board Louisiana's discussed time publicly. has expired. I now yield five minutes to the gentlewoman from California, Ambassador Watson. Uh, I want to direct this uh, question to Mr. Moynihan. Uh, after Kenneth Lewis approached officials at the Fed and the Treasury Department about invoking the MAC, Fed Chairman Bernanke expressed skepticism about the truthfulness of the Bank of America's claim, stating in an email that he thought the threat to use the MAC is a bargaining chip and we do not see it as a very likely uh, scenario. Was the MAC, and do you know, used as a bargaining chip to get more Federal assistance and or a lower purchase price, a lower purchase price? Congresswoman, the, the MAC was a right under the agreement to terminate the agreement if there had been a material adverse change. The $21 billion lost in the fourth quarter constituted a, gave us a valid claim for a MAC. What immediately became clear is we had a very, very difficult situation in very difficult times that I think reasonable people tried to figure out a, a solution that necessarily didn't result in litigation and in the aftermath of having a company that could have been uh, uh, failed that we would have had to litigate against. And it was those judgments that led us to take the course of action we did, which we thought was, which we believe and was in the best interest of not only our shareholders but the economy. Um, and and that's how it came down. I mean, it's it, so the MAC was an absolute uh, was a right we had the right to exercise, but the context of where we ended up was a discussion around what is the best course for our company. Uh, Mr. Mayopolis, before the issue of the MAC arose, had the Bank of America engaged in any discussions with representatives of the federal government? about receiving additional TARP funds, do you know? Not that I am aware of. Okay. Had they not attempted to invoke a MAC, and do you think Bank of America would have received the additional $20 billion in TARP funds announced on January 16th? I don't know. Okay. Mr. Gifford, in your testimony you stated that you had a number of tough decisions and questions about the reaction or transaction at the start. Could you please describe the problems you foresaw with the merger? Uh, yes, <clears throat> Congressman Watson. Overwhelmingly, my issues uh, back in September, this was in September, had to do with timing. Uh, we were at a time when the next day Lehman failed. The day after that, there was an AIG bailout, if you will. And within two weeks after that, I think WAMU failed and Wachovia was taken over by um, Wells Fargo. So my point is, at a time like that, inevitably, your, your guard is up. 
And when we're uh, looking at a transaction at a time like that, admittedly, in a short time period, uh, I, I, I was just in a, if you will, a very sensitized state. So it was much more along those lines than it was Merrill Lynch itself. Merrill Lynch, for a long time, we knew was a terrific addition to Bank of America. As I said in my testimony, uh, I believe and believe, believed and believe it's a tr 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 terrific strategic combination. It was very difficult in December and January as the markets became much worse than we or anybody uh, had expected. So that's my background, ma'am. Well, do you think the shareholders were given adequate information about Merrill Lynch's economic condition and compensation practices prior to their vote to approve the merger? The, uh, as a board member, uh, Congresswoman Watson, I felt, it had felt continuously and do, do feel that management, and it really is a management issue, to determine, working with inside and outside lawyers, what should and shouldn't be disclosed. There was absolutely nothing in my mind that we, that we were holding back information that we should. Uh, I can assure you that if I or any member of the board felt that way, which again we did not, we would have raised the issue. Well, do you think the shareholders will ultimately benefit from the merger? I, I do indeed, ma'am. In fact, so far year to date this year, which has started out hard, uh, it has been accretive to our shareholders, accretive to our earnings. Uh, let me go back to Mr. Mayo Pullis. Uh, during your tenure as general counsel, you did not report directly to CEO Ken Lewis, but your successor, Mr. Uh, Monahan, did? That's correct. Okay. To whom did you report as uh, general counsel? At the beginning, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Congresswoman, at the beginning, uh, I reported to uh, the vice chairman and CFO, Mr. Hance. Then I reported to the chief risk officer, Ms. Brinkley. And finally, I reported to Mr. Moynihan. Well, do you think reporting directly to the CAO would affect the general counsel position? I think that it can affect the general counsel position. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah, time gentlemen's is time has expired. I uh, now uh, yield five minutes to Mr. Chafee from Utah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you all for being here. Uh, Mr. Gifford, my questions are, are directed at you, uh, if I could, please. Sir, um, did you at any time feel pressure from the federal government to complete this transaction? Uh, yes I, or no? I, I, it's hard to quibble with words, sir. I, I felt, again, getting it from the CEO, that the government was very desirous of us completing the transaction. But that, you, you, but on, and then you also said, I, I think if I heard you earlier in your testimony, quote, in a perfect world, it would have been better to walk away, end quote. Why? If it, what, what was the pressure that was creating this imperfect world that led you to come to a because conclusion? Because we had a contract to buy Merrill Lynch. But you could have, could have stepped out of, right? No, with due respect, sir, the, a, a material adverse change clause is not straightforward. Uh, there have been m few material adverse change clause. I'm not a lawyer, so I could be getting over my head. Neither am I. I'll uh, take that to credit well, that, for that, both that's of us. Helpful yes. to me. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, have, have been successful in Delaware court. But uh, the point it, I want to try to get to is, was the government get, applying pressure that affected your decision whether or not to move forward and, with and, this? And I, what I have said, and, and I'm under, uh, under oath for sure, that for me, the key decision was not the government threatening board seats. Uh, because if that were the key, then I would not be doing my fiduciary duty. The key was the uncertainty of the MAC, to litigate a MAC, to walk away and say we're not going to close. Uh, the uncertainty of whether we'd win was a lose-lose for the Bank of America shareholders. The, if we my, lost my time's short, and I, my apologies for cutting, cutting you off, but if we could pull up uh, slide number seven, if we could. Sir, this is a, uh, uh, my understanding, an email of uh, Wednesday, uh, January 21st. I hope you're familiar with this. Can you just go through who this is to? I can't see um, And I'd like to know who these people are, their relationship to you, and what they do professionally, starting with Ramsey Trussell. Oh, God. Oh, Lord. Yes, right. sir. This is, a, this is an email dated January 21. Yes. Uh, it's addressed to my, my four children, Ramsey Trussell, Charlie Gifford, Rufus Gifford, Jessica Gifford, uh, with a copy to my wife. Could you real quickly tell me what your children do professionally, and do they do anything politically? I can. Uh, Ramsey Trussell is a stay-at-home mom. 
hardest job of all. My son, Charlie Gifford, works in Boston at a private equity operation. My son, Rufus Gifford, works here in Washington as the finance director of the Democratic National Committee. My daughter, Jessica, works pro bono, not pro bono, in the pro bono area of a law firm in Boston. And my wife, Ann Gifford, takes care of me. And now in this email that you sent out, it said, I'm going down to point number three, which is midway through the first page. If we can pull that up, I believe part of it's highlighted. Uh, you're talking about Merrill Lynch. This was a bad mistake. Oh, this now it says, this was a bad mistake, and their assets became much worse than expected when presented in September. When the deal was announced, we were 20, 31 to $32 a share, and then boom, this was a bad decision. And when we realized same, the U.S. government pressured us to stick with it. That's when they agreed to give us more capital and guarantee some of their bad assets. That seems to be in direct contradiction to what you've said time and time again in this committee, that they were, well, they, you know, it was important to them. But here you're clearly directly saying it was a bad decision and a bad mistake. Why? Who are you lying to? Which, which, is, which is accurate and which is inaccurate? Uh, I, what I've said, Congressman, is that I believe, and I voted for it in September, that's fact, that in, and I based it, notwithstanding worries, that it was a good strategic decision. What happened since then, as we all know, <clears throat> the markets went fluey. And to the point but where... But you see the let, challenge... Please, you if you're going to ask me the question, I've got to continue, sir. I realize you have five minutes. Is, is that it got so bad in December that we tried to figure out a way that to, to exit the transaction. It was within that context that the fact that we would eliminated our dividend, Merrill Lynch had lost $21 billion. Uh, in this period of time, when the day was the darkest, and I'm expressing to my children what's going on with the security of Bank of America, that's what it was. I, I, I'm just confused by your, the inconsistency of your um the way you characterize the decision, because in, in what was at the time, I'm sure, seemingly private, to your wife and your children, you're saying it was a bad decision, it was a bad mistake, uh, essentially that we shouldn't have done it, and yet publicly you, you're putting a, a real good face on it. Let me go to the end of this paragraph, uh, this end of this email. What do I worry about? A serious 12% 12 12 plus unemployment number that is prolonged, or really stupid politicians, or extended panic in markets. I don't think that will happen, dot, dot, dot. There is some stuff I'm not saying vis-a-vis -vis some of our management decisions. We'll do that in person. In the meantime, I'm sleeping fine and so should you. What is it that you told them in person that you're not that you haven't disclosed here today about the management decisions that would be pertinent to this, to this decision? Congressman, uh, I have no idea what I told them in person. Uh, absolutely no idea what I told them in person. And I was obviously right, wrong about stupid politicians. Now, you were, that's the one thing I could agree with you on. <laughs> that was the sense of credibility I saw in this, this document. So. <laughs> the gentleman's time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> I now yield uh, to the gentleman from Massachusetts, Congressman Lynch, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the witnesses for coming before the committee and helping us with our work. As a matter of disclosure, uh, Mr. May was formerly with NSTAR, uh, active in my district back in Boston. Mr. Gifford was formerly with the Bank of Boston, so I have, uh, and Mr. Moynihan, I have familiar with, familiarity with him as well. And uh, Bank of Boston and uh, NSTAR, just as a matter of full disclosure, were supporters of mine when I was back in the State Senate. So that much out of the way. Uh, Mr. Mayopoulos, I want to ask you, uh, I'm a little confused on the, some dates here. Uh, my timeline that I have, uh, and it's been provided by the committee, indicates that uh, you were fired on December 10, 2008. Is That's that correct, right? Sir. That's correct. Okay. And it says four days later, December 14th, then Ken Lewis learned of a $12 billion loss at Merrill. And yet your testimony indicates that you advised on the fact that the $12 billion may or may not have been a material adverse change. My timeline indicates that that would be impossible because you were fired before the 
the events giving rise to the MAC. And I'm just, I'm not questioning your, your, your test of veracity at all. I'm just trying to get the facts straight here. Can you help me with that? Sure. Congressman Lynch, um, on December the 1st, uh, I advised Mr. Price and Mr. Curl that I didn't believe that there was a material adverse change uh, based on the information that I knew as of that time. I was not informed at that time that there was a loss at Merrill Lynch of $12 billion. Uh, okay. At that time, I understood there was an after-tax projected loss of approximately $5 billion. You, right, right. And, and, and that's true. Because the Bank of America shareholders were provided with information that there was a forecast of, I, I believe, at the time of the approval of the sale of about $9 billion. And then later on, there was an additional disclosure, uh, apparently December 14th here, when Ken Lewis learned of a $12 billion loss at Merrill. And so your, your, uh, your testimony is consistent with that. I'm just, I was just curious. We've been looking at this undisclosed uh, addition of $12 billion in losses as being the MAC and, you know, the, the, the subject of your, of your letter, and that's, that's not necessarily the case. Okay. Um, in Ken Lewis's testimony, his deposition at uh, page 84, he indicated that uh, in his conversations with uh, Secretary Paulson, that uh, Secretary Paulson promised to fill the hole. That's a quote. He'll fill the hole that uh, the recent losses of $12 billion had caused after the losses were disclosed. Uh, later on, he said he went back to the board. I think uh, at least a couple of the witnesses might have been on that board at the time. I'm not sure. And then subsequently, uh, Bank of America received uh, $10 billion from the top in connection with its purchase of uh, Merrill Lynch on top of the $15 billion that it says it didn't ask for. And uh, that's also supported by Eric Roth's testimony that was raised by the ranking member and Mr. Jordan uh, that uh, you will, quote, get, get additional investment. That was uh, a statement that, uh, that he recounted. Tell me about that. Uh, Mr. Gifford, Mr. May, were you in the boardroom at that time when, uh, when Ken Lewis told the board that uh, Paulson said he was going to fill the hole uh, with uh, apparently taxpayer money? Uh, we we were in the board. Uh, we had uh, just found out about the expanding losses, uh, the accelerating losses. Uh, we did talk about uh, first about the MAC, uh, and I was one that was very much in favor of pursuing that route because of the losses and because of the effects on capital that Mr. Moynihan mentioned earlier. And then we talked about um, the other issues, uh, which were the government's desire to have this go forward and the fact that financial help similar to the first tranche of TARP could be available to us that would plug that hole. So yes, we were, we were, uh, we were in those dis discussions and uh, that continued for some time uh, throughout the month of December and into January. Thank you, Mr. May. Mr. Gifford, were you there? Yes, sir, I was. Is that pretty much? Uh, it, it is indeed, Congressman Lynch. Okay. Uh, so you're being reassured, if I'm trying to repaint the picture here, you're being reassured by the United States Secretary of the Treasury that if you go forward with this purchase of a private company, that the United States taxpayer is going to fill the hole, is going to, is going to protect your losses uh, from that purchase. Is that, is that basically how it went down? Uh, ultimately, yes. Uh, there, were, there were two aspects. Um, one which, again, was uh, similar to a transaction that happened for, uh, for uh, J.P. Morgan, and that was a so-called uh, fencing off of the bad assets. And so there was uh, an insurance policy, if you will, a wrap of the bad assets uh, so that losses would not uh, continue to escalate if we went forward with this transaction and cause further damage to the balance sheet. And so uh, those two elements were negotiated between the company and, uh, and the feds and uh, uh, ultimately was the, was the path we took instead of trying to pursue uh, an MOU. All right. And was, there any, was there any discussion in that, that board meeting or thereafter about uh, the advisability of informing the shareholders about, all, I mean, here you got, 
events that uh, you, cause you to consider a ma material adverse change in this huge purchase, which is fairly momentous, and, and then on the other side of the scale, no one is talking to the shareholders. And I understand that, you know, they had been advised that there were some losses at Merrill, but, but here, here you're talking about something on a different magnitude. And I'm just wondering yeah. uh, if there were discussions at the board about whether the shareholders should be informed. I think we, we generally understood the rules of the SEC with respect to quarterly reporting and 8K or special events reporting. And uh, we were not able to, uh, it's, if we disclosed something that didn't happen uh, and wasn't closed, uh, we could have misled them in the wrong way. And so typically what you disclose is a transaction that you have. And we ultimately were able to get that term sheet signed on uh, around January 16th. Uh, and that's when we disclosed it. Gentleman's time is long expired. Okay, thank the gentleman. I yield back. Right, definitely. Uh, Congressman Bill Bray. Thank you. Mr. Monahan, um, did the Bank of America uh, pressure a special outside counsel, uh, Wachtell Lipton, to make a case um, that the firm didn't believe in on the MAC? Wachtell Lipton is. Uh, this is what they do in life, and we rely on them as outside counsel. I, I believe that uh, they were given the facts of the losses that we found out about, as, as Congressman Lynch talked about, uh, in mid-December that were, had moved to uh, $14 billion or $18 billion pre-tax and ultimately $21 billion. And they uh, came to the same judgment and advised us that they believed that we had a MAC clause, uh, a, right to, uh, a valid right to claim under the MAC clause. I think the advice that uh, people look at is it's these are difficult cases and they and they make it clear that you've got to be that as you think about it you got to balance the uh, the potential and success but the reality was that they gave us the advice and they were consistent in their advice. so your outside counsel you hired specifically on this issue um, was not unduly pressured to come up with this answer I not to, I had no knowledge of that or anywhere to your knowledge uh, did anyone in this committee actually interview this outside counsel um, that was advising you on the MAC? I, I, uh, uh, I'm aware that I think they talked to some of the staff of the committee, is what I was told today. I, and I think you they, were told I think, what? I think Walk Tell Lipton has talked to committee staff, as far as I, I know. I'm not positive, but I was told that. I, I think committee staff could probably. But, at, but have they been, in, but as far as we know, they haven't been interviewed specifically about their MAC advice? I think they, uh, I don't know. I'd have to ask. I don't know. I, I don't know, uh, uh, honestly, what was what okay. going on. Um, for the record, as far as I know, we, we haven't specifically, there's been a claim made that they've unduly influenced, and they basically were being pressured by you or by the, by the company to come up with a justification. Um, when, in fact, as far as I know, we haven't sat down and gotten that testimony directly or allowed them to come here and, and explain their position. It seems, doesn't it seem a little interesting that here you had a special counsel directly advising that there is a question about where, you know, what pressure was put on them, that they're not testifying before us today? I, I'd leave that to you. I, I have no knowledge that they've uh, been nothing but clear that, that we had a claim for Mac. Okay. I, I just think that I think I appreciate all of you being here today. I just think when we leave out somebody as critical as a special counsel, um, that there is an issue here that we need to go in. I, Mr. Chairman, I'd really like to raise the issue again that special counsel on something this important should be considered. And um, Mr. Gifford, I understand your concerns as this process. I'll tell you the testimony we heard from Paulson here in this committee was there wasn't specifically a you either do this or we'll fire. But there was a statement here that said, if you don't do this and it doesn't work out, they'll be held to be paid. And I think in the jargon of, of um, uh, grown individuals, that pretty well indicates that this was expected. Um, the MEC was, was uh, a, a very important issue to the government, and they did not want you to execute that MEC. Is that a fair observation? Is that consistent? That testimony consistent with what you you observed? It is, sir. Okay. 
And, Mr. Chairman, I just think that a lot of times um, nuance and words do matter. And I, all I got to say, if someone told me, uh, look, Congressman, if you don't do this and you get in trouble, where you know there's going to be hell to be paid i would take that very personal as being the fact that there was going to be action taken against me one way or the other and i would expect any staffer who was given that direction by me would take that as a direct um persuasive uh statement if not a downright threat I, uh, this time i'd yield to the ranking member mr chairman i thank the gentleman mr gifford in light of your email uh your your family personal email that has now come to light if, if we asked a question that is a little different, and we, 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 we danced here for quite a while with Mr. Lewis, the government clearly asserted or intended to assert pressure. You were being pressured by the government is what that, that says. So when we ask you, did you feel pressured, that's always the ambiguous word. But was the government clearly pressuring you? Your own email says that. Isn't that true? I, the pressure. No, uh, no, no. No, this is one of those times in which you only get a yes or no for a reason. You've, you've said here, you've said they were pressuring. Yeah. You stand by your email as truthful? I believe the government, uh, I've got to worry, I'm sorry, sir, I've got to use words that well, I'm do you, I'm, were I'm, you I'm, telling, do you stand by your email as truthful, sir? The, I, I wrote an email to my children trying to explain a certain circumstance in the largest financial holding we have. And w w words in a private email to your children are probably I, I, I didn't even proofread it, Congressman, I said, to be honest. Wait, I'm uh, giving so you an opportunity. You weren't under oath. We're, I'm giving, this committee is giving you an I, opportunity to say that, that y upon reflection you don't agree with the email you sent or you stand by it as truthful and, and in fact, the government was pressuring that the words speak for themselves. Uh, I, I, I think it is fair as to say, as I reflect, that the government pushed us hard to do this deal. If that is, the, if that is interpreted as pressure, sir, then, it, then I would interpret that as pressure. Gentlemen's time's expired. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, the chair recognizes uh, Ms. Norton from the District of Columbia. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, 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 Mr. Gifford, you used what for me in all of these proceedings uh, is the seldom invoked word fiduciary, and therefore I'm I'm much more interested in the role of the boards here, and yet generally in the newspapers and general discussion, the role of boards it seems to me has been given too little uh, attention. Uh, would you agree that in our system of corporate governance, the board is where the buck stops? It, uh, I think the board is the ultra, ultimate decider of a corporation. Would you, wouldn't you agree, Mr. May, to that as well? I believe I would. Um, I, I'm fascinated by the role of the board. I served on the board of three Fortune 500 companies before coming to Congress. I'm trying to put myself in your position given the crisis context in which you were operating. Uh, could I ask each of you how long were you on the board, the board here? Uh, I joined the Bank of America Board, uh, Congressman Norton, in uh, 2004. I did also at the same time. Yeah. So you were, you understood the business, you had, you were experienced uh, board members. Could I ask you, um, um, prior to uh, Mr. Mayopoulos's termination, what was your opinion of the job he had done as general counsel. Um, I, I thought he did a fine job as general counsel. I would concur. Uh, how did you learn of his termination? As we testified earlier, Congressman, in an email from the chief executive officer on the afternoon of December. So there was no discussion uh, about terminating uh, the general counsel uh, whose reputation with you was solid, no discussion with the board about his termination, but an email informing you of his termination? That's correct. Uh, in light of the fact that you had seen no uh, issue or problem with his work, um, would you ask for an explanation as board members 
given the context of a deal going forward at that time? Uh, I, I, I believe, uh, as I said earlier, um, we had a context. Uh, we had uh, shifting sands, as they say at the time, because of the Merrill merger, and there was dislocation of many executives. Yeah, this was not an issue Mr. about May, performance. I heard that explanation. I heard that explanation. And I can understand that if there's a merger, you don't need two of everything. The context in which, I, which my question is addressed is that there's the middle of December, there's a deal in flux in the middle of a crisis in the United States and a crisis in your com company. Don't you think you could have made that change uh, in the usual order of business rather than in the middle of, uh, I mean, were you making other such changes in the middle of the deal that wasn't even consummated yet? It was, a, it was a chief executive officer making a decision on who he wanted on his team, and he was concerned about losing uh, Mr. Moynihan at the time, as we said earlier. And that's the decision he made. And losing we Mr. Moynihan, him. who wasn't even in the position, but had a position in the company. He was in a higher position in the company, uh, one of the key four had or five Had he threatened executives. to leave? He was, he, we had been uh, notified that afternoon that he was leaving the company, yes. So you, you believed it was important to change general counsel while you were in the midst of, as board members now, while you were in the midst of this deal because you might otherwise lose Mr. Moynihan, whom you didn't keep for very long. Th this was Mr. Lewis's decision. Um, I'm asking whether or not as board members with a fiduciary responsibility to the shareholders, as board members where you, yourself, you yourselves have said the buck stops here, whether or not you inquired in detail as to this uh, huge change in the middle of, of the deal, or whether you simply accepted, as you said, Mr. May, it's somebody else's decision. Uh, I, I uh, supported the decision. I Based on what facts? Uh, on, on the facts that uh, Mr. Lewis uh, was choosing a team, putting a team together, and he felt that the best qualified people for his management team Included On Brian. reflection, if you were doing such a complicated deal in the middle of an economic crisis in our country, not only the deal within your company, uh, would it not have been uh, uh, prudent to uh, await the completion of the deal one way or the other before shifting ships on top of the, uh, shifting chairs on top of the Titanic? Uh, the general lady's time, time has expired, but, you the, other but the gentleman well? may answer the question. Um, again, uh, the, the, uh, the actual transaction involved literally dozens of our executives, and Mr. Moynihan was more involved in the transaction of Merrill and putting it together and all of the risks associated with that business platform than Mr. Mayopolis was at the time. He was a more critical member of our management team at the time. Uh, the chair recognizes uh, the gentlelady from California, Ms. Chu. You may proceed. Uh, Mr. Moynihan, you highlight the success of the merger, but uh, can you tell us about uh, Bank of America's initial rationale for consummating the deal with Merrill Lynch? Uh, did this rationale change when Bank of America learned of the financial loss at Merrill Lynch? And if the transaction continued to be beneficial, why did Bank of America consider pulling out of the deal? Was this about leveraging the Merrill Lynch losses to renegotiate the purchase price? I, th I think you have to separate from an operating perspective the, the logic that uh, I think that led us to acquire Merrill Lynch in September to agree to acquire Merrill Lynch was about the uh, brokerage firm capabilities it gave us, meaning the 15,000 financial advisors, was about the capabilities it gave us investment banking and the capabilities it gave us in sales trading. Those facts are the same facts that bear today that we are number one in those businesses in the, in the, in the country and, and, uh, and number two in some around the world. Uh, those facts from an operating base were all true. What we faced in the late in 2008 was from a uh, earnings perspective, capital perspective, the situation changed dramatically in the markets in the in effects. And after, in, in the mid-December and out, when the losses came clear of the amount they were losing, there was a different set of decisions. Even with the value of that business as an operating basis, that we had to make to protect our shareholders. And that gave rise to the uh, assertion of the claim for the MAC. Um, well, 
again, uh, let me go back to the fact that you focus on, uh, so much on Bank of America's uh, responsiveness to consumer needs. However, the real focus of this hearing is about the circumstances in which uh, your bank received an additional $20 billion in hard-earned taxpayers' dollars. Can you give specifics on how this additional $20 billion has been disseminated and util utilized? Uh, is any of this money going to this year's executive bonuses? Uh, the, the money that was received as part of the Merrill Lynch transaction, which is the hard-earned taxpayer money, was meant to provide the capital that Merrill Lynch had lost in the, in the fourth quarter uh, and, and to stabilize that platform so it could be acquired. Uh, it, it, sits there to, it sits there today as capital in our company. It allows us to provide uh, business and, and consumer loans, as I, I stated earlier, so it is put to good use. Um, it is put to good use to make loans. It's put to good use to uh, provide uh, commitments to business and governments in, in these tough economic times. It's not, uh, it's not used to pay bonuses. <coughs> Will it go in any time in the future for, for executive bonuses? I, I think Mr. Lewis would have told you, I think when he was here, if I remember right, or we'd all agree that the, uh, that the idea is uh, we will pay this TARP, back, uh, TARP money back as soon as we can, and it will not be used to pay bonuses. It's my understanding that when you were offered the general counsel position by Ken Lewis, you had not practiced law in over a decade. Why do you think uh, the CEO, Mr. Lewis, gave you this position? And also, why were you asked to report to him directly when the counsels before and after you were not required to report directly to the CEO? Uh, I had been reporting to Mr. Lewis continuously since I came in the company. Um, and I, the, uh, so I think the reporting relationship remained that I had. It wasn't a change. It was a change for the general counsel position, but it was not a change for my reporting relationship. Uh, Mr. Lewis asked me to be general counsel, uh, and Mr. May talked a bit about this in terms of how we're changing the company's organizational structure and management in the context of the Merrill Lynch merger and in the context where changes are being made. I accept the position because it's what the company needed me to do. Um, Mr. Gifford, uh, today we discuss your concerns about the merger with the Merrill Lynch. We know you, you raised these concerns privately, but did you raise any objections about this with your colleagues on the board? Yes, I did. Uh, and and I, I might add, the Congresswoman, the, it really was asking questions at the board, and, and other directors also raised questions about certain events and the timing and so forth. Thank you. I, I yield back. Chair recognizes the gentlelady from Ohio. Ms. Kaptur, you may proceed for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me just state that as a citizen of our country and a representative from Ohio, the important question to me is uh, for the future, what quality of banker uh, and banking system America should restore uh, to regain prudence and confidence in our marketplace again? and a banking system that is sound. And as I listen to you gentlemen testify, that's the thought that keeps running through my mind. What about the future? Um, the total TARP money that went into Bank of America uh, is over $45 billion, as best as I can tell. And Mr. Gifford, you're one of the largest shareholders in Bank of America. Is that true? I, I wish I were. But I, I am for me. I, I've, for, for my family, I'm a large shareholder, but it's hardly one of the largest. Who's the largest shareholder in Bank of America? Uh, I think it's um, at Barclays. What? It, it would be the uh, 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 a series of institutional shareholders. Institutional uh, shareholders. Uh, like a, a Barclays Global Investors. A, who who uh, was the first one? A Barclays Global Investors. Uh, I couldn't Paulson. hear you. It, it would be a series of institutional shareholders like Fidelity, Barclays Global Investors, Wellington, uh, John pa uh, Paulson, Hedge Fund. It's a whole series of people like that. Um, can you provide that for the record, the top ten, please? I, I, if we're allowed to do it uh, under uh, the law, we'd be happy to. All right. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Gifford, how did you become a board member for the Bank of America? Uh, I became a, a board member, Congresswoman, when uh, Fleet Boston Financial, of which I was chairman and CEO, was purchased by Bank of America. At that time, for a short period of time, a year, I became chairman of Bank of America and since have stayed on the board. All right. Was that a normal bank or was that a private equity fund? What kind of institution was that in Boston? Uh, I'd like to think it was a normal and good bank. It was a normal good bank. Did you do subprime loans out of that bank? Did, did, you, do what? did you do subprime not loans? To the best of my, not to the best of my knowledge. You now. didn't enter into that market. All right. According to the, share, the uh, Charlotte Observer, 
this month, there's a story that's rather critical, uh, Mr. Giffords, of your um, presence on the board stating that uh, you may well be the highest paid executive associated with the board other than Mr. Lewis, uh, though he's gone now, I guess. Uh, it states in the article that uh, just for your airplane flights, the Bank of America spent $947,682 uh, on those flights on private jets and another $281,307 to help you pay the accompanying taxes on those. The story then goes on to state that um, that is does not include the bank paying you more than $225,000 in office and administrative support, uh, and then it doesn't go into your restricted stock and other benefits uh, that accrue uh, to your uh, present position. Uh, would you agree with the statement that they make in the article here that um, you are by far the most highly compensated member of the board? I, I think that I believe I am uh, as a result of my retirement agreement from Fleet uh, five years ago. That was a contract, Congresswoman, uh, that was agreed to five years ago as part of uh, my retirement for the corporation, retiring early and so forth. Uh, it is not part, if you will, directly of my compensation as a board member. My compensation as a board member, excluding my retirement agreement, is the same as every other board member. Well, you know, I looked at a poll yesterday and it's talking about what the American people think of the country and the direction we're headed and they look at all these bills that have passed Congress and they're very angry because they feel that the stimul that the uh, bills that have been passed up here um, such as the TARP have benefited two-thirds of the American people think they've benefited the big banks and their executives and so forth and they don't feel anything we've done up here has really helped them ten percent of the people think anything we've done to date has really helped them uh, you know and I just say to you you're a value setter in your industry you have one of the largest institutions in the country and um, uh, what people think is pretty important in terms of confidence in our financial system. And um, the people are very angry. And I would just urge you to think about what you can do institutionally uh, to set, a, to reshape the value set that is operating inside these institutions. Because something is fundamentally wrong. And um, uh, nobody's against somebody making money, but when most of the public's incomes are going down and people are making extraordinary uh, salaries and, partic and benefits, particularly when the public is supporting these institutions on life support, um, we have to behave differently. Uh, Congressman, um, I can appreciate the difficulty of that. Thank you. Thank you. I want to say, Mr. Myopoulos, you, the timing of your termination was very, very curious. And um, could I ask you a question in the way your institution, the institution you used to work for, functions? Why would the chief risk officer, uh, whose own name I guess is Amy Brinkley, or was Amy Brinkley, be the person tasked to terminate you? Is, is that what kind of an organization? You were the general counsel? Were you the top lawyer? I was the top lawyer. General Woman's time has expired, but we allow him to answer. We allow the witness to answer. Yes, go ahead. I was just curious, what kind of an organization are you? The top lawyer. I'd want my lawyer right there. Uh, why would why would you go to a risk officer? And is she still with the company? As I understand, she's no longer with the company, and I don't know why she was sent to fire me. Yeah. And who did she report to? She reported to Mr. Lewis. All right, gentlewoman's time has Thank definitely you, expired. Uh, the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly. Thank, <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Gifford. And thank you all for being here today. Mr. Gifford, when did you first learn, when did the board first learn that there, were, there was a significant hole at Merrill Lynch? Uh, <clears throat> Congressman Connolly, we fir uh, first learned on December at the December 9th board meeting that the loss had uh, increased to $9 million, uh, to, sorry, $9 billion. $9 billion. $9 billion. And uh, was that information revealed to shareholders? Uh, not, I don't believe at that time. Is there a reason for that, Mr. Gifford? The, in in uh, circumstances like that, Congressman, we, we on the board rely on management dealing with lawyers, as you can appreciate. It's pretty complex with SEC laws and so forth as to what should and shouldn't be uh, okay. sent out to our shareholders. Mr. Certainly, May sorry. I'm sorry, Mr. Gifford. Mr. Mayopoulos, I wanted to go to the lawyer. Mr. Mayopoulos, uh, 
did you advise Mr. Lewis or anybody in senior management that maybe that piece of information needed to be disclosed to shareholders? Well, I also learned at the Bank of Directors Board meeting on December 9 uh, that uh, the projected loss had grown to $9 billion. And I sought to talk to Mr. Price, the CFO, after that meeting. He wasn't available, and I, sought to, uh, I decided I would talk with him the next day, and that day I got fired. Uh, you first learned that the loss was about $9 billion at the same time Mr. Gifford did? Yes, sir. When did you first have a conversation with Mr. Lewis or other senior officers of the corporation about possibly invoking the MAC? The only conversation I ever had with uh, senior executives at the company about invoking the MAC or whether it should be invoked was, uh, uh, or could be invoked, was on December the 1st. I can't hear you, sir. December on what? December 1. December 1. Why would they be talking about invoking the MAC on December 1 if the information about the uh, extent of the losses of Merrill Lynch were, was available only eight days later. Mr. Price uh, did not tell me why he was asking. He just asked me to review with him the terms of the material average change clause, how it would be interpreted, and we discussed whether... In retrospect, Mr. Mayopoulos, would a reasonable person perhaps uh, deduct that the reason he initiated that conversation on or about December 1 was that, as a matter of fact, he was in possession of the uh, extent of Merrill Lynch's material losses long before December 9th. I don't know. I don't know what Mr. Price knew at that time. Do you know what when uh, Mr. Lewis had conversations with Mr. Paulson, then the Secretary of Treasury, uh, Treasurer, uh, in the uh, Bush administration about invoking the MAC? No, I don't. Are you aware of the fact that documents have been provided to this committee that there were several conversations, one of which took place while Mr. Paulson was on his treadmill? Uh, no, Congressman, I'm not aware of that. Do you, when you were asked about the MAC, what was your legal opinion about the validity of invoking the MAC by BOA? My opinion and my advice at the time was that based on what I knew, I did not see a basis to invoke the MAC. And five, the nickel's worth, why not? Because there had not been a disproportionate impact on Merrill Lynch that was outsized to the impact on Bank of America and other companies. Mr. Moynihan, you, and I'm going to ask you to move that microphone close to your mouth because I cannot hear you. Uh, thank you. Why did you have a differing legal opinion about that? I think there's some confusion about the timing from when Tim, Tim was general counsel to when I became general counsel in the sense that when I came into general counsel on December 14th or 15th, we became aware that the losses had now reached $18 billion pre-tax. It was a different set of facts and circumstances than Tim uh, has testified to here today. Faced with that $18 billion pre-tax, which went to $21 billion pre-tax, or ha basically half the capital of <coughs> Merrill Lynch, twice the amount it ever earned in its best year, that's when the question of the MAC that I had to address was at $18 billion that moved to $21 billion loss. And that was in, in the week that began uh, December 15th, so and I, then took us through that. So if I understand your testimony, you're saying the difference between you and your predecessor as general counsel was the extent of the loss. The, the losses have gotten much more dramatically different, and that's been the testimony that you've heard. Uh, during uh, the course, after the, in, in mid to late December, the losses kept getting worse and worse and worse. Well, in your opinion, wouldn't a $9 billion loss qualify for invoking the MAC? That's a pretty significant loss. Sir, uh, when I came and faced the facts, the loss was $18 billion pre-tax. That gave rise for valid claim of MAC. Yes, I understand. But you were certainly reviewing the opinion of your predecessor, were you not? Did you disagree with his judgment? The, the facts were different. I was looking at I understand that, dollars. Mr. Moynihan. I'm asking you a different question. Did you, in fact, disagree with your predecessor in his judgment about the extent of the loss and whether it qualified for the MAC at the time of his opinion to senior management. I, I did not reflect on his opinion. I faced you, the facts. You had no reflection whatsoever. I had no reflection on you his opinion. You only looked at the losses you started with when you became the general counsel. That was the situation we faced was the, fifth, with the $18 billion of pre-tax losses that were disclosed. I find that extraordinary, Mr. Chairman. My time is up. Right. The gentleman's time has expired. I yield five minutes to the gentlewoman from California, Congresswoman Speer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Mayopoulos, why do you think you were fired? Congresswoman, I don't know why I was fired. Well, you must have an opinion. We, what, why do you think you were fired? I have speculated about lots of things, but in the end, I don't know why. I wasn't, I wasn't the decision maker. 
I don't know what considerations went into it, and I don't know. Do you think it was because you had the you offered the opinion that the MAC could not be exercised effectively? I don't know. I wasn't given an explanation. Right. I don't uh, know. Mr. Moynihan, you evidently indicated that you were about to leave the company based on testimony we heard from Mr. May. So what was your conversation with Mr. Lewis? Uh, about what, ma'am? Uh, about leaving the company or about the About general? leaving the company. Uh, Mr. Lewis had asked me to take a job uh, to run the credit card business, which would require a change in location. And uh, having gone through this with our company and predecessor companies, uh, uh, I personally couldn't do it. And it was a, my decision that, that because I personally couldn't do it, I, I made a decision about uh, my potential future with the company. And then, um, I know that may sound uh, different to people outside of a large business like ours, but when you make a decision, you know the ramifications of that decision. So at, at that point, he said, well, wait a minute, um, we'll make you general counsel? What did uh, he say to you? No, it, that was uh, uh, in the days prior to this, and, and his statement was, I understand your decision, and, uh, and that was basically the, the discussion. All right. You would, in hindsight now, reflect on the decision to buy Merrill and, and, Merrill and probably suggest that it was a, a good decision. Is that true? I would, as I said... Uh, the operating business that we uh, have in between Merrill Lynch and Bank of America by putting these two companies together is a business which is very good for our customers and could do many things that neither company so could do. So you made money in the first quarter. Is that true? Uh, we made money at Bank of America in the first quarter after that. And the second quarter? Uh, yes. And in the third quarter? Uh, we did not make money in the third quarter. Okay. So two out of the last three quarters you've made money. Um, you paid how much for Merrill Lynch? Uh, we, we issued about uh, 25 to 30 percent of our stock. Uh, the value, I think, was in the $20 billion range at the time. About $20 million. $20 billion, I think. $20 billion. Yeah. Excuse me. $20 billion. All right. And then the, f the taxpayers of this country have now given Bank of America about $45 billion, correct? That's correct. So we've almost paid for Merrill two times over. Uh, the... the uh, TARP Investments and Bank of America had three different pieces. The first piece was done back in I understand. In I'm just talking in total. So in total, you've received $45 billion from the taxpayers of this country. We have received $45 Merrill billion. Merrill was purchased for about $20 billion, and two of the last three quarters you have actually seen um, profits. Uh, yes, that's right. All right. Now, the taxpayers have seen the interest rate on their credit cards jump to 29 percent in many cases. Um, Many of your clients now are paying 29 percent interest on credit cards. You were in charge of the credit card division, so you're pretty familiar with that, correct? We, we continue to look at the, uh, the credit card. It's not a majority of our clients. It's clients that have the risk characteristics. And we pulled back on the pricing and stopped all repricing uh, for risk in advance of the Card Act, which none of our uh, peer companies have done. So you've actually reduced the actual interest rate you're charging? We, uh, the, the pricing that uh, you're talking about is pricing when people uh, have delinquencies or repricing cards based on risk in the portfolio, and we have uh, not done that as the Card Act that comes in um, shortly here would not allow you to do it. We actually stopped that uh, last, earlier this fall. So what is the interest rate that most credit card holders are paying, the range? I'd have to, I'd have to get back to you. I could give you that. Uh, I, I don't know it off the Are top they of paying it. as much as 29%? Uh, there could be a, a cardholder who uh, has significant risk and other things that could be paying that much, yes. Are they paying 35%? I, I don't know what the cap is. I'd have to get back to you on that. Well, when you were at the head of the credit card division, how much were they paying? I'm not the head of the credit card division. It's run by one of my teammates that works for me, but I'd be happy to get back to you with all the information about that uh, and give you the details about that. Okay. My, my only point in, in pursuing this line of questioning is that there's got to be something in it for the taxpayers. And right now, the taxpayers feel pretty burned. You've heard that from a number of members who have, who have testified. I don't want to focus on exec comp. I want to focus on what can we do to the, to the taxpayers in this country. So I guess my suggestion to you and to any bank that has received TARP funds is that during the time in which you have TARP funding and federal support and taxpayer support, that you should reduce the interest rate you're charging the taxpayers of this country to something close to 12, 14, 16 percent, but show some goodwill uh, to the people that are picking up the tab. 
My time has expired. Yes, gentlewoman's time has expired. Let me call on the gentleman from Illinois. I'm sorry, from Missouri, Mr. Clay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my questions are for Mr. May and Mr. Gifford. Um, in your testimony, you state that this acquisition is already bearing fruit. Uh, however, it seems that these results have come at the expense of the taxpayers and shareholders who were not fully aware of Merrill's losses. Uh, do you feel that this deal was fair to both shareholders and American taxpayers? In other words, uh, do you believe that the ends justify the means? Mr. Gifford, you can start. Uh, 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 Congressman Clay, the, uh, the answer is yes, I do. Uh, in, in terms of the Bank of America shareholders, as b b both Mr. May, uh, Mr. Moynihan and I have testified, we believe this is a good transaction for shareholders. There was a time in December and January when it, when it looked very, very dicey. But uh, as I said earlier, it's accretive to date. So I think the shareholders, we, have, we are building uh, an incredible platform for our customers. As it relates to the taxpayers of this company, I'm uh, sorry, of this country, the, uh, I, as I said earlier uh, in, re in response to a question um, uh, from the ranking member, uh, the board uh, of this bank is determined to pay back the taxpayers in full with very significant dividend payments, uh, which uh, uh, t t the timing is inexact but we are very determined to do that. And by putting these two companies together, you, you made for a much stronger company who has the ability to repay the taxpayers in full, which we are determined to do. Mr. May, was it a seamless merger? Uh, no, it wasn't. Um, as, uh, as the analogy has been discussed earlier, this marriage has had its ups and downs. Um, we thought uh, in September that it was uh, a great had great potential. In December, when the losses were piling up, uh, we were concerned about its ability to, to, to execute on the mission that it had, and that, by that I mean Merrill. Uh, with the addition of the, that TARP capital, that, uh, that uh, things have improved, and, and as a result, uh, I do feel very good about the future. And, and I'm, I'm not sure if uh, this question has been asked uh, yet, but how much does Bank of America plan to pay out in bonuses and similar awards this year? Uh, there has been no uh, decision. The year has not uh, been, been uh, completed yet, and that will be based on the performance of the company at, uh, in January or February when it is being looked at. Um, looking forward, uh, what is the projected timeline for, the bank, for bank of America to return uh, federal bailout monies? Uh, sir, the board continues to uh, review the issue. We are discussing it with the government. Uh, those discussions are very sensitive, uh, but uh, uh, we hope it's sooner than later, and that's all I can say at this time, sir. Okay. Um, it, are are you familiar with the uh, the process of liquidating uh, the combined toxic assets of both Bank of America and Merrill Lynch? And if so, uh, could you give me some kind of, of sketch of of how that will I, I, work? I think Mr. Moynihan is oh, ideally Moynihan, ca go ahead. capable. We are, yeah, as we have continued to uh, work down uh, the assets that uh, you would refer to as toxic assets. Um, they continue to go to be uh, worked off the balance sheet over time. Um, and uh, the team that uh, works on that uh, works every day to, to bring those balances down. Um, and they're lower now than they were last week, and they'll be lower next week than they were this week. Mr. Moynihan, were you familiar with the um, circumstances surrounding the departure of Mr. Mayopoulos? Uh, Congressman, uh, uh, I was not involved in the decision, but what I talked about earlier was the context of where we were as a company and the context of downsizing both Legacy Bank of America management and bringing the company together. Uh, these were very difficult times and continue to be difficult times in the economy, and we've been shaping our uh, uh, associates uh, a head count down, and, and it was in the context of changes in senior management that went on at the time that affected not only Mr. Mappas, but about 10 percent of our senior executives. Okay. All right. I, I thank the uh, panel for their responses. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentleman from Missouri. And now we just have closing statements. I will yield five minutes to the gentleman from uh, Ohio, Mr. Kucinich, the chairman of the subcommittee that has jurisdiction. 
First of all, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for holding these hearings. Um, it's uh, given us a rare window into the management suite of the largest bank in the country. Uh, what we've seen is a story of how Bank of America's top executives allowed guesswork to masquerade as expert knowledge, how numbers were pulled out of thin air. And they guessed at numbers, they guessed wrong. Their uh, wrong guess hurt shareholders, involved the taxpayers of the United States, and created great consequences for, um, for markets, not only in this country, but around the world. Um, and I, I don't think that uh, the Bank of America scenario is unique. But the house of cards that was built through collateralized debt obligations, credit default swaps, um, the subprime mortgage fiasco, has ended up burying our constituents under debts they can't pay, record rates of foreclosure, joblessness. And yet, frankly, it would be wrong to put this all on the Bank of America, or to put it all on Wall Street. Because in our economic system, uh, if we have a true system of checks and balances, uh, we would see uh, some measure of discipline exacted on behalf of uh, the people of the United States. And this in investigation has also raised questions about um, government oversight, about the agencies that are charged with protecting shareholders and protecting taxpayers. Um, from what we've seen, it's, it's not clear there's been any criminal conduct, uh, but it is clear that there has been a, um, a lack of fidelity to shareholders and to taxpayers. I appreciate that Mr. Moynihan, in his opening remarks, talked about uh, where we are in terms of the economy. And, and we need to start looking forward here. We're, at, we're really at the end of this uh, discussion about who did what to whom. But we really need to look forward with 15 million Americans unemployed, with another 10 million whose homes are at risk, with businesses failing all over the country. Report yesterday, 47 million Americans hungry. We really have to start looking forward. And this is, within the context of our economic system, really going to be a matter of finding a way for business to do its part in, in creating more liquidity, for the banks to do your part to create more liquidity so businesses can survive, for the government to do its part where the private sector is failing to create the jobs, for the government to create the jobs. The President's having an economic summit in December about that. Uh, we really have to find a way of looking forward. And I'm hopeful, Mr. Chairman, that as this committee continues to uh, do its work, you know, we, we understand the responsibility for the collapse is spread pretty much across the boards. Where do we go from here? What do we do to the people who are worried about getting a job? They don't really care who's going to provide the job. They sure want a job. And that's where we have to find a way to work together to create that. Because otherwise, you know, a year from now, when, when we're being judged on our performances, uh, people are going to ask uh, not whose side were you on, not whether you were on the side of Wall Street or on the side of the administration or on the side of the taxpayers. The question is going to be, what did you do to help pro protect, not just protect, to help enhance the economic position of, of that average American, the person who's struggling to hold on to their homes, their jobs, their retirement security, their investments, their health care? What did you do? 
And that's going to be that question and our response to it, both in government and in the private sector, is going to determine whether or not people can have confidence in our system anymore. Not unlike the questions, Mr. Chairman, that were posed in the 1930s. I'm hopeful that on this side of the table and on that side, that we're going to have the right answers. Because if we don't, uh, this, this system is, is threatened at its core. I yield back. Thank you, gentleman from Ohio, for his um, comments. Uh, and now you have five minutes to Mr. Jordan, the ranking member of the committee, also from Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank our witnesses as well for being here. I know it's not easy to come here and take the abuse and questions you get from members of Congress, but we appreciate it. Uh, this whole escapade just highlights why we should have never traveled down this road. This, this unbelievable path we put the country on with this unprecedented government interference in the private sector is just, it, this just shows why it's bad. I mean, but for the Merrill merger, which was done at the prompting of the, the phone call from Hank Paulson to John Thane, who said you need, but for that, Bank of America would have never needed TARP funds. Under any conventional analysis, you wouldn't have. But the government says you're going to take the TARP money. Then the government says you've got to complete the deal with Merrill Lynch. Then the government, based on what we, we've got here from Mr. Moynihan, basically prohibits you from giving the money back now that you're in a position to return it to the taxpayers. And now we have the, the amazing thing to me, particularly when you think about this institution, Mr. Chairman. We have a federal government pay czar telling private American citizens how much money they can make in the United States of America. I mean, think about where we're at, because we started down this trail. That's what troubles me as we go forward. Mr. Kucinich is right. As we move forward, we need to make the right kind of policy decisions across the aisle. But, but they need to be decisions where we scale back this, this unbelievable move by the federal government to get involved in the private sector. It is making matters worse. Heck, if big government spending and big government regulation was going to get us out of this mess, we'd have been out of it a long time ago. That's all we've been doing for the last year and a half. It is wrong and it needs to stop. And this example and these hearings, and I appreciate the chairman having these hearings, these hearings highlight what's wrong with the path we chose to take. The ranking member Ice and I didn't support the TARP. We thought it was a terrible idea. But this is the move the Bush administration, the Obama administration have taken us down. It is wrong. And all you got to do is look at this example and the American people, I think, more importantly, see where this has taken us and see that it's wrong and they want us to turn and go the other direction. And with that, I would yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I now yield to the gentleman, the ranking member of the full committee from California, Congressman Issa. Thank you, Mr. For Chairman. Five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, in closing, I, I want to ask unanimous consent that uh, a page from the SIGTARPS report be included in the record. Reserving the right to object. Okay. Uh, <laughs> now, it's only fair. Uh, I want to thank you all for being here today. Uh, I want to thank the Chairman for considering a document which shows that the only money that was given to Bank of America was the $6.2 billion that Merrill Lynch got, most of which you would not have gotten if we hadn't bailed out AIG at 100 cents on the dollar, and the 0.8 or $800 million, peanuts really by Washington standards, that B of A got directly. These were for the, uh, the credit defaults, the, essentially the guarantees. Seven billion is what you got that you shouldn't have gotten because AIG should not have been bailed out at 100 cents on the dollar. You should have taken your haircut there, and I'm sure you would have in the ordinary course if the government hadn't intervened. Our hearings today have made it very clear that, one, Merrill Lynch was not worth what you paid for it. Had you been able to negotiate in December instead of in September, you would have been able to negotiate a much lower price. I think Mr. Gifford made that very clear, that had you been able to do the deal with what you knew in December, you would have done it for a lower price. We have had a series of, of hearings, starting with Stan O'Neill being brought up here to try to explain why he got tens of millions of dollars while bankrupting Merrill Lynch, while the company was going the wrong way for a very long time. At the time, I wasn't sure that those, those hearings were really worthwhile. We, after all, we were looking at public companies who paid large bonuses to their executives when, in fact, their stock was going down. They, those executives explained to us that those were accruals from an earlier time. Now it seems interesting that we, we had the very man who set up the company for failure at Merrill Lynch 
in front of us, and we never asked him, what about the brokers? What about Merrill Lynch's future? What about the risk that are being taken in order to have any profits at all in the company, at least on paper? I wish we had an opportunity to know then what we know now. But with what we know now, we know that you gentlemen were pressured by the government, and depending upon how we define pressure, we can put it a lot of different ways, but it was very clear that Ken Lewis and uh, uh, Attorney General Cuomo made the record reasonably clear that, in fact, pressure was being applied. We also know that in the ordinary course of banking as we knew it before uh, the meltdown, the $45 billion that is currently owed would be repaid. That, in fact, our position of interest-bearing uh, preferred stock would be repaid. America would have been made completely whole by Bank of America's investment. The stockholders of America would get a higher yield than we ordinarily get on money that goes out uh, from, from the government, far higher than the rate that uh, T-bills pay on our debt. So to use a term out of the financial services uh, industry, the arbitrage is positive. Bank of America will pay back all of the money that it borrowed during the bailout. Having said that, the legacy of government intervention, and as Mr. Jordan said, one which he and I did not vote for, continues. Long after you are eventually allowed to pay back the $45 billion, we will continue to have people in Egypt and other countries where we have been telling them to privatize their banks for generations and telling them about how government does not create meaningful jobs and that they need to have a vibrant private sector, we will continue to have those countries ask us, did you really mean it when you said it and what has changed? So, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to us continuing to look at the AIG bailout, one in which Secretary Geithner, then the head of the New York Fed, appears to have made a decision to pay far more in these guarantees than the current market value. And in fact, the paper which was floating in some cases in the market at far less than 100 cents in the dollar went immediately to gains for those who held the paper. And Mr. Chairman, I hope that and the administration that we would like to have in to complete this hearing will come in due course. I thank the gentlemen for their time and for giving us a very effective half a hearing today. And yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I would also like to thank the witnesses. I would like to thank all the members for the participation, of course, and the staff for uh, their uh, work as well. Before I begin my final comments, I want to make an observation with regards to Mr. Myopoulos, who was abruptly fired in the middle of this transaction. He, d he does not know why he was fired. His boss, Mr. Moynihan, says he does not know why he was fired. The board members present don't know why he was fired. Either it was divine intervention or someone didn't like his legal advice. Being I'm from Brooklyn, I'm leaning towards that last one. It looks to me like Ken Lewis and others at the company weren't about to tolerate someone who might get in the way of what they had planned to do at this shotgun wedding. The central question of our investigation was how did Bank of America acquisition of Merrill Lynch, which started out as a deal between two private sector companies, become a $20 billion, B as in boy, federal bailout? After four days of hearings, hours of testimony, and a review of a half million documents, it looks like the answer is pretty clear. The facts show that Bank of America, one of the largest banks in the United States, was able to manipulate federal regulators to obtain billions of dollars in taxpayer money to help it go through with the deal that it intended to do in any event. In a way, it was quite a feat. Bank of America will probably end up being held in business schools across this country as a result of their innovative, innovative approach. While the financial world was crumbling around them, they saw an opportunity to snap up Merrill Lynch, a leading company in the field, and get the taxpayers to bear the risk. 
This has important implications for public policy and how we approach problems like this in the future. Billions in taxpayers' money were committed in secret. No one outside, a privileged few, knew anything about it until weeks after it was over. That should never, never happen again. As Congress considers regulatory reform, I think we need to focus on the need to protect consumers and shareholders. Thank you again for being here today. Without objections, I entered this binder into the committee record, and without objections, the committee stands adjourned. <laughs>